Okay, now it's live on YouTube. Okay, so uh, so should we start now, or let's wait for more panelists? I'm going right. through the yeah the attendee list. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll give a short interview of. Uh, our discussion leader today. <laughs> <laughs> you already started. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I already started. So, uh, uh, Jia, um, before you went to turn this group as a graduate student, uh, where did you get your undergraduate degree? Uh, at Zhejiang University. Zhejiang University in mechanics. Yeah. Uh, in mecha engineering and mechanics, yeah. yeah. And then you went to uh, Turn Lee, got yeah. your PhD and spent a few months at Harvard and then yeah. went to Northwestern with Winkan Loom. Yeah. yeah, for two so, years. Uh, Winkan, mm -hmm. with uh, Winkan, um, uh, for how many years? For, I think, about two years. Uh -huh. Two years. So, did you really do computation? Uh, no, I would say, <laughs> yeah, the, the thing is like this. So uh, Professor Liu asked me to do computational mechanics on fracture. Mm -hmm. So basically he wanted me to develop a phase field model on mm -hmm. fracture. Mm -hmm. uh, basically he asked me to compete with Tom's Hughes group. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> that, 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 that's impossible for me. Uh -huh. So uh, basically over there, I, I was still working on uh, energy materials. Uh, under his uh, supervision. And mm -hmm. I tried my best to develop some phase field model, but it, it, it didn't work that well. Yeah, so, uh -huh. so I would yeah. say uh, I was still do, uh, working on solid mechanics over there, but not on computation. <laughs> computation yeah, this, is, is too hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's, uh, Zheng is uh, too humble. I, this is one thing I find uh, Zheng I always admire him as uh, he's uh, he's uh, he's fearless to get into new areas. Mm -hmm. If I look back to his years in my group, when he joined me, um, joined my group, he was a fresh undergraduate uh, um, college student um, mm -hmm. with nearly zero research experience. The only thing I I knew at that time is. Uh, his GPA is very high, so uh, <laughs> without any hesitation, <laughs> I, I invited him to join my group. And then uh, when I looked back, I was actually amazed at the, how many different topics um, he dived into. Mm -hmm. He was on, working on, you know, uh, the uh, uh, plasticity, uh, mainly uh, mm -hmm. when he was doing PhD with me. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, toward the later part, and he won this uh, fellowship mm -hmm. from my university. And mm -hmm. he said, I want to learn soft matter, soft mm -hmm. materials. I said, OK, if you want to learn, <laughs> go to the best <laughs> group in the world. And that's and at that time, I don't think he has much of a yeah. knowledge about the soft mm -hmm. material. So and then thank you for hosting him for half a year. I mean. Every stop he went to, and then as you mentioned, he, he went to Northwestern into a computational mechanics group. Yeah. Um, but it's more of the research at that time. I saw his publication at that time is more is interfacing this computation mechanics with, yeah. uh, you know, problem driven uh, research. And then he, he you, you spend a, a year or so in uh, Vicky's group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, he, he after that he spent a, about a year in Vicky's group on um, continuing what? the after the postdoc at the Western. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So yeah. what was your topic in Vicky's group? Uh biomechanics, so um yeah. uh, collagen Vicky materials. Yeah. Vicky really is terrific. Yeah. So I remember uh one year I went to Charles Hopkins to give a talk. Yeah, we could just show me her interaction with the doctors about eyes. Yeah. Did you work mm -hmm. her, with her on eyes? No, no, I, uh, I didn't work on that topic. Yeah, yeah. So I was working on some 
uh, computational things on collagen mm. materials, studying the, how the stress uh, interact with this growth process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, I, I would like to thank uh, Teng uh, because uh, in 2014, I, I believe Teng forced you, Zhigang, <laughs> to accept me, uh, accept me <laughs> as a visiting student. Uh, but th that was a great experience for me. So because over there we had we had several discussions, and I got to know uh, many world class young researchers like like uh, Jian Yu, uh, uh, Ruo Bing, Li Hua, uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, Tong, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Zheng Jin, just, just name a few, yeah. So uh, currently, my group is mainly working on uh, mechanics of soft materials yeah. uh, because you know mechanics of soft material is a very important direction in in Zhejiang University. Yeah. So uh, my group is working on soft materials, both theoretically and uh, experimentally. Uh, I would say without that experience, it, it, it wouldn't be possible for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Thanks, Tom, yeah, for Zhejiang University. Yeah, it's uh, quite special now. Um, so, uh, do you get a chance to interact with Tiafeng? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I, I'm working with Tiafeng mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, yeah on the robots uh, for the yeah. deep sea applications. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And also, I... yeah, you guys have a quite a collection of uh, really good people. Uh, Shao Xin, Shao Xin is a yeah. young leader. And also yeah, you yeah, have yeah. a middle-aged leader, um, Yang Wei uh, is a Wei senior Chou. leader. And uh, then there is Wei Chou. Wei Chou, oh, Wei Chou yeah. is just terrific. Yeah. He's a yeah. such, a, such a good guy. Yeah, actually tomorrow morning, yeah. Zheng will present a webinar in uh, okay. another platform, uh, yeah. which is very popular in, in China, yeah. Ke Yanyun. I think, uh, Zheng, I look forward to your talk tomorrow to see your yeah. new research progress over there. Yeah. 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 Started yeah. from 7 p.m., which is very early for people in U.S. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Turn uh, back to you. Now, uh -huh. uh, uh, things are vague in my mind. I remember you came to Princeton, not to my group first. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember you always joked at me. So I, I yeah uh, actually when I applied uh, that at that time I really want to get into material science because I feel my training um, is solid in mechanics but in terms of material science science if I looked back now it's much better if I understand it correctly but when I was there uh, you, you dive deep deep into mechanics then the material side of that is actually weak. Uh, for example, I don't think there is any class uh, or course I took I teach you what is dislocation. Um, mm -hmm. I learned all this when, when I was in Princeton. Now uh, applied and then uh, and uh, Princeton was there is a that's when Tony Evans was there. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the uh, director of the Princeton Material Institute. Yeah. PMI, if you still yeah. remember. Yeah. Um, so I decided to join his group. Uh, I did for like uh, a year or so. And then he decided to move to back to UCSB, UC right. Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And he was so kind. He offered me two options. He said that, <laughs> Tell you either you can follow me and uh, I'll make sure that you can transfer to, can transfer to UCSB and then uh, complete the PhD study there. Or if you want to stay here, I totally understand. I'll make sure that you will be taken care of. Um, I have some practical uh, uh, situations I need to deal with because uh, my wife will be due in a few months um, to our daughter. Uh, it's kind of a to me is sort of adventure if i decided to move to a new environment princeton is already a new environment for for us so mm -hmm. and also she was still taking uh, her degree uh, classes uh in rodgers so mm -hmm. i couldn't move so i decided to stay and um, here you go <laughs> yeah. always joke with me that uh, 
I adopt you. <laughs> so, uh, 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 Tony Evans abandoned you, and I adopted. No, it's not like like that. But uh, it, it's 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 my decision. Thank you for for adopting me. <laughs> yeah, did you also uh, win a this uh, very prestigious uh, award, Wu Fellowship? Did you? Do I don't think so. I I won the uh, PMI Fellowship, the oh, Princeton Prin uh, Princeton. Uh, yeah. Material Institute, so it allows me, uh, it offered me extra spending uh, money and also uh, allow me to have the freedom to choose among the different advisors. I remember clearly at that time we were in a conference room with uh, uh, with you, with David uh, Sorovitz, with Wally uh, Sobejo and a few others, and we were talking and. Um, no, it was fun, and <laughs> after another year or so, and you told me that you are moving, <laughs> <laughs> offer me the similar situation, and but at that time I decided to follow up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. also uh, now, and then um, this is a part of big in my mind. After you did your PhD, you didn't do, you did not do a postdoc training. Is that right? Uh, very briefly and still were in your group and yeah. thank you again for <laughs> keeping me for a few months at because that few months i was actually in job market uh yeah. interviewing and uh, uh uh keep going with my research uh, at that time uh, on our uh plasticity of thin film on polymer substrate yeah it, it was a very short transition to me yeah was that hard? Hey, hey, Suling, Suling. Hi, hey, Suling. Morning, morning. morning. Yeah. yeah. Hi. What was it hard for you to to just uh, become a faculty without a postdoc period? Was uh, it, it is. It is. I I would argue that uh, it, uh, it it is a hard job. I remember you mentioned this to me, offered mm -hmm. these tips for me. Yeah. Uh, it will be a hard job, even if you have a postdoc experience. Yeah. Oh. But a postdoc experience uh, get you uh, more familiar with independent research, as John mentioned. That that's yeah. when he was leaving my group. I offered him the advice and uh, you know, spent a, a few years, a couple of years, two to three years as a postdoc. It helps a lot. I was uh, in the position that, okay, because uh, I remember one thing you told me in your office, you said, okay, Tang, you know that many people, they work on one topic for their career. It's their PhD dissertation topic. <laughs> and some people work on two, okay. It is their PhD topic and a postdoc topic in the rest of their career. And if you want to do research, you better do more than that. So I followed that and uh, remember uh, last week I was uh, sharing my experience that friends also offered me some tips. Mm -hmm. He, he suggests me to uh, try to establish yourself. It is hard. It is hard. I was, but one thing I learned, I think during the PhD and your group is uh, uh, working with other people, collaborating with people in a different field. And that's really uh how you uh, you know get new ideas that's what i did when i joined so um i have a, some very nice colleague at that time called alan williams oh. uh yeah, yeah. Is she, 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 she is she is she is um she yeah, was surface, the right? she yeah surface, right? Yeah, she, she's a surface scientist. She's in the physics department. And, and the physics department in my yeah. university is very uh, solid and strong. You know, the gravitational wave, yeah. uh, this uh, thing. Yeah. The early stage, this this equipment, the facility was built there. Oh. They kept it. So this famous picture uh, a couple of years ago when that was in the news, that was actually in the physics department lab. Yeah. Um, so anyway, she was the director of the MERSEC uh, uh, in our university, uh, and I talked to her and uh, get some advice. 
she started working on graphene uh, for quite a some years because of, you know, as a uh, material scientist, a physicist with the folks on the surface um, science, uh, she asked me uh, that, have you ever worked on it? I said, no. Uh, uh, but she suggested that, you know, there is a lot of uh, uh, problems, issues, new opportunities, because graphene, when you go to monolayer, it always need to be interfacing other materials when you use it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I get started to mm -hmm. know this material and start to work on this mm -hmm. uh, material uh, before this, uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the discovery of experimentally uh, making the graphene. Well, 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 uh, uh, yeah. Du Ling is here. I actually want to ask one question. Never got asked. You know, you two, Suling and uh, Turn, mm -hmm. you two actually started EML discussion. Is that right? Uh, I think that's correct. Um, I think- So uh, you were the two founders yeah. of EML. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy yeah. and I were drafted to do your bidding. You guys actually did the work. I think that we are not strong enough. <laughs> but, but, but that but, was your idea. Yeah, I think I think we started the conversation. Um, I, I you know Teng and uh, I always very close, studying from from our you know long journey back in China. We're in the same group, <laughs> so whenever we have any um, difficulties in our life, we share, right? So. Uh, I think I remember that at one time I submitted a paper to physical review letters and they get rejected. And uh, somehow I, I, I talked with Ten. I said, I, said I, I told him that, hey, all the other uh, communities have, uh, have letter sized journals. Why our mechani mechanics uh, community does not have? So at that time, I think we were in a conference in uh, Illinois and Jimmy was the uh, uh, host of that conference. So we talked with Jimmy about that idea. Why it's not we establish It's the summer school, right? Summer, summer school, school right? the Gen 4 summer school, yeah. Gen 4, Gen 4, Gen 4 summer school. summer school. I think it's 2009, 2009. 2009, uh, uh, probably later. Anyway, so yeah, I remember it was a summer school and uh, we went to Jimmy's house and uh, after Jimmy played nicely, gracefully <laughs> on his grand piano, it started the discussion. I was amazed that Jimmy can play piano so well. And then, yeah, that, that and then we discussed the, the initial idea of, uh, of actually launching, try to launch a letter size journal for mechanics. Yeah, when Jimmy talked to me, interesting. Yeah. When Jimmy, Actually, me, oh, sorry. I remember uh, the, the real discussion happened at a Chinese restaurant. This was a <laughs> Taiwanese restaurant. We mm -hmm. actually went all the way to a neighboring little town to, to especially to taste that oh, food. Oh, I see. I remember. And yeah. we, we discussed that at that okay. restaurant. Yeah. That restaurant helped. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. The, the seed of EML. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was brought in much later. When Jimmy talked to me, I think Jimmy first talked to me. I didn't really want to do it. So <laughs> I, but Jimmy was such an old friend. I, was, I don't know how to say no. Then I was very clever. I thought I was very clever. But Jimmy, why don't you also invite John Rogers? I thought John Rogers would never do it. And Jimmy invited, and John, John Rogers agreed to do it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so you have no more excuse. <laughs> I ran out of excuse. It's a butterfly effect, huh? Mm -hmm. that's, that's great, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy, what did you do to persuade John Rogers to do a journal? <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Jimmy always but, very persuasive, um, yeah. persuasive, uh, very good, uh, you know, on that. No, no, uh, John is one of the rare uh, material, well, many material scientists uh, appreciate contributions of mechanics. Yeah. 
but Jiang actually loves mechanics. So uh, it's a very interesting uh, character of him. So he, first of all, he is a very positive person. Uh, many things you talk to him, the first response would be, it's great, let's do it, or, or you know, very enthusiastic. But one thing that he's especially keen on is uh, combining mechanics and material science. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I started to appreciate that when John first joined Illinois. Uh, this was actually not, not too long before the 2009, maybe a, a few years before that. So I went to one of his uh, internal seminars and very impressed. And after that, I went up to talk to him. Yeah. And uh, he was very enthusiastic about mechanics. So uh, I think when, when Drigang, when you suggested that, I thought it's, a, it's just natural to ask him. Hey, Glaucio, good to see you. You are muted. You. Really happy to see you. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but one, uh, one comment you. I have <clears throat> is uh, I think Tung is an extremely multi talented person. Uh, Thank you. Agreed. <laughs> uh, he's been able to, uh, you know, get all these resources. Uh, you know, I don't even know many of these things. Uh, but one thing I think uh, Tung and Zhigang did early on that has essentially laid the ground of uh, social media <laughs> in mechanics, which is iMechanica. I think this is a beautiful idea excellently executed and uh, it has made tremendous difference. Yeah, but uh, I don't know if a turn agree with me. The new thing is Twitter. I'm totally persuaded. Oh yeah, so actually I was connected with Glaucia through Twitter recently. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I embraced the idea of a social media, but you know, I haven't been using Twitter for, <laughs> for a long time. But yeah. once I started, it's amazing. Yeah, uh, there are actually scientific data showing that if you use Twitter to advertise the research, it helps. Uh, I, I'll share some uh, papers uh, on that later on. Not, not today, but later on in other venues. <laughs> Klausio, do you agree? Well, I completely agree. I completely agree. And uh, also Zigang, uh, he was my inspiration for Twitter. He's very good in, in Twitter. And uh, <laughs> when I saw Zigang, I said, okay, I will. Klausio, you should uh, at least put your photo on your Twitter account. <laughs> Why not you, your account doesn't have a photo? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me quote. Let me quote Jigang uh, oh. as when we were doing <laughs> iMechanic. He he made an analogy. I think it's uh, uh, very good. Uh, so uh, he said that iMechanic is like a Boston Common. I think the social media like Twitter and other things is like a Boston Common as well. It's just there, open to everyone. If you go there, play and enjoy, it's yours. If you don't go there, it's others. And it doesn't really change if you go there or not. But if you go there, you will be changed. Yeah, yeah so. it's a place to build a community. Yeah, yes. that's true. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, where is Jen? Jen, uh, Jen. Yeah, I'm here. Now I'm you're here. the boss. <laughs> yeah. So okay, uh, it's ten o'clock now. Uh, Should I start to share yeah. then while you are talking? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay, so welcome to today's YAML. Uh, EMS uh, webinar. So this is Zheng Jia from Zhejiang University. I was a former PhD student of Professor Teng Li, uh, and I'm also today's discussion leader for my advisor's talk. Uh, okay, so today's webinar will be given by uh, Professor Teng Li. 
So Tony is a Keystone professor in the Clark School of Engineering at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, he received his PhD degree in engineering science from Harvard University in 2006, uh, following earlier studies at Princeton University and Tsinghua University. Uh, his research interests focus on mechanics of sustainable materials, uh, low dimensional materials, energy materials, soft materials, and so on. So among his awards include R&D 100 award in 2018, uh, Samuel Lanley Distinguished Professorship from National Institute of Aerospace in 2017, and the SES Young Investigator Award in 2016. And he's currently the Associate Editor of Extreme Mechanics Letters uh, with Zhi Gangso. So he co-founded Amechanica, the world's, uh, the world's largest online community for mechanicians and their friends. Okay, so now I would like to call upon Professor Teng Li to speak to us. The floor. Uh, uh, maybe I should see the screen is yours, Professor Li. Thank you, Zheng, uh, for this kind of intro introduction. And also, uh, thank you, everyone who is currently uh, attending this uh, uh, EML webinar live or and the future viewers of uh, uh, the playback of this video. Uh, thank you for your support to EML webinar. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about our recent uh, research progress on the uh, advanced materials toward a sustainable future with a particular focus on the mechanics design. Uh, given the broad uh, uh, audience of uh, EML webinar, I want to start uh, with a minute to explain uh, where I located and my university and also my department. And uh, I'm located in Maryland, east coast of the United States. Um, it's uh, very close to Washington DC, about half an hour driving. And the DC is a little square here. As you can see, it's surrounded by Maryland and Virginia. So these three places typically is called DM DMV area or the DC metro area. I'm, in the University of Maryland. Uh, uh, the photo here, uh, this gentleman is uh, Dan Mote. Uh, he was the uh, president of my university when I was uh, recruited. And he happened to be my department colleague. And we're actually in the same focus group, mechanics and materials. Uh, he's a, a world uh, leading expert on the dynamics research. And he was also the former president of the United States National Academy of Engineering. Uh, I'm in the mechanical engineering department and uh, 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 the great George Irwin, uh, one of the founding fathers of fracture mechanics actually spent his uh, uh, final years as a faculty member in my department. I took this photo uh, back in 2013 at the 13th uh, International Conference uh, on Fracture, um, where the George Irwin Medal was uh, given to uh, the great Jim Rice and also John Hutchinson. And John was also the first inaugural speaker of EML webinar. Okay, uh, I'll get started. So I want to start with uh, this plot here. This gives you the size of the world population over the last 12,000 years. Um, it's actually interesting observation. So 10,000 BCE, there was only 4 million people in this world. It grows very slowly over the time. It's always increasing. At the year zero, there are only, still only 190 million people in the world. And then in the last 2000 years, you see a significant increase of the world population, increased more than uh, uh, 20, 30 times. It's always increasing. Of course, uh, there is a minor dent here or uh, diving uh, downward. That is corresponding to the mid 14th century, the Black Death pandemic in Europe killed 200 million people. Overall, it's always growing the world population and people need food, people consume. So this demands the material consumption, which in turn always has been driving the material discovery. I'll choose one example, uh, steel, which is actually a very strong indication 
the production of steel is an indication of the economy of many countries. Uh, the earliest known production of steel occurs around 2000 BCE. Now let's focus on the past 200 years. As you can see that 200 years ago, the world population is around 1 billion. Now in 200 years, the world population increased more than seven times. And the modern mass production of steel starts around 1855. That's when the Bessemer process uh, uh, became available. And then after that, this uh, steel production uh, around the world uh, increases significantly. Let me show you this data here. Uh, this first bar is the world uh, steel uh, production in 1950s. After less than 70 years, it increased 10 times. This is the data for 2018. The steel production is actually energy intensive. I'll show you the next chart where you can compare the energy cost of various construction materials. You can start with stone, right? Stone is there, you just uh, 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 get it, cut it, cut it, and the energy cost per cubic meter of stone is 50 kilowatt hour. And timber wood is seven times of that, 350. Now, if you look at the steel, which is here, it's more than 100 times more energy needed to uh, produce steel than produce uh, timber wood. And aluminum is even higher. The energy of consumption during the uh, pro production of the material uh, has a strong correlation with the carbon dioxide emission. Um, so indeed, the steel production accounts for 8% of the annual global carbon dioxide emission. So it has heavy environmental impact as well. So this is actually a very interesting uh, data. It's a prediction. It's also based on the existing data. The uh, brown dots are the projected production of the global crude steel. We are now at 2020, we're here. Now, if we keep going the pace we're doing, by 2050, the world steel production of steel will reach around 2,500 uh, million ton. Now, the price in terms of a carbon dioxide emission is in green it's always increasing if you keep increasing the steel production. Now, this yellow line is the carbon dioxide budget we have in the two degree scenario. The two degree scenario is uh, agreement uh, that, okay, within this century, we want to limit the temperature increase within two degrees Celsius. Now, as you can see that this is decreasing budget and we are here. We are already above the budget, we are overspending. Now, if you keep going like this, the budget gap will be increasing all the time in the next 30 years, okay? I'm gonna switch the gear a little bit and play a, a movie clip here. It's uh, called The uh, Graduate. Uh, Dustin Hoffman. I mean, with your future, your life. Just well, that's a little hard to say. Party. Ben, excuse me, Mr. McGuire. Ben. This gentleman is trying to Mr. offer him some career advice. Come with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Excuse us, Joanne. I'm sorry. Thank you. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Exactly. How do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. Sure. I've said. That's a deal. So the film, the movie was filmed in 1967. And this is the global plastic production in the past 70 years or so. And in 1967, it's about here. 
So the global plastic production is around 20 million tons. And in the next 50 years or so, the global plastic production increased a lot from around 20 to more than 400, increased more than 20 times. And nowadays, as everyone realized, plastic is almost at every corner of our life. Unfortunately, most of the plastics we produced end up as plastic waste. And this is the global plastic waste generation. As you can see that the uh, percentage of the plastic uh, waste generation after the uh, used uh, is very high. And if you look at the different categories here, see this, the blue one, which is the majority of the waste is actually from the packaging. Now with this pandemic going, more and more people are buying online and uh, you receive more and more this packaging materials, which are actually plastic from the packaging film to the, uh, the foam as the, the, the peanut foam for uh, uh, impact absorption. So therefore, as you can uh, probably notice that uh, in the recent years, there were more and more uh, news coverage, press release, and all this, and not only those, but you see around us, the uh, uh, plastic pollution, getting into the uh, uh, natural uh, habitat uh, or the, and also the ocean. As of 2015, uh, approximately more than 6 billion tons of plastic waste has been generated. Actually, less than 10% of them are recycled. Majority of them that end up in the landfill or natural environment. If we keep the business as euro by 2050, uh, it is expected that there will be 12 billion tons of plastic waste there. And the problem of the plastic is it takes very, very long for them to degrade. A styrofoam cup, 50 years. A drinking water bottle, plastic bottle, for 50 years. That is the time needed for them to degrade. So this ever increasing plastic waste generation and this extremely long time to degrade poses the global sustainability, sustainability challenge. And uh, I want to show you one photo. This is taken by a group of Japanese scientists back in 1998. It was taken at the bottom of the Mariana Trench uh, known to be the deepest part of the ocean. Guess what they found over there? It's the debris of a plastic bag. So the plastics is getting into the ocean all the time. And if we keep doing something like this, in 30 years, there will be more plastics in the ocean than fish. So I was preparing this talk last week and I was reading this uh, uh, Millennium Project. It's a global initiative. They listed 15 global challenges over there. The very first one is the sustainable development and the climate change. Last week on, on Wednesday, Science Journal published this paper called Evaluating Scenarios Towards Zero Plastic Pollution. I feel it's perfect timing. So I look into that and I quoted some interesting data here. So if business as euro, we are right here right now, this plot the plastic leakage into the ocean every year in terms of a million tons. If we keep the business as euro in 20 years, the total amount of the plastic leakage into the ocean will be 430 million tons. And among which less than half of that can be managed by recycle, proper dispose, but more than 50% of that, it will be mismanaged. So would, which means that it'll get into the ocean and cause the pollution. The hope is, I think I found this report very interesting and encouraging is, now if we work together now, this they call the system change scenario by reducing the use of plastics by substituting with other sustainable materials by proper recycle and the disposal, you can significantly decrease this mismanaged portion down to 10%. That's actually 
very encouraging. And also, as you can see in the next, next 20 years, there are a lot of opportunities wide open for scientists to work on. For example, the research I'm gonna talk about today is more toward the substitution of the plastic materials, a portion of my talk. And they show that this actually can drive the percentage down by 17%, okay? I hope by now I've set up the stage that I convinced you that there are dire needs for the new solutions to advance the materials. Now, just like you want to buy someone trying to convince to buy a new product, there are two things that matters to you uh, to make you decide, are you gonna buy it or not? First thing is, is it good? It need to be as good as what you have been using. A second thing, it cannot be too expensive. It's too expensive, I'm not buying it. So here's the wish list of this advanced material we want. So they need to be in high performance, at least comparable to what we're using right now. It need to be abundant. So therefore the cost will be low. Otherwise, if you have high performance, very expensive, this idea won't fly. The energy consumption to make it need to be low as well. Ideally need to be sustainable, leaving low carbon footprint. And I also learned that it's possible that it can leave a negative carbon footprint. This seems a very strange, a stringent of a list of uh, uh, features we want for this advanced material. But I want to show you in the rest of my talk that actually you can get inspirations from mother nature to find the materials satisfy these features. I'll use the next uh, uh, remaining time of my talk to share with you uh, one material we have been focused on in the last uh, several years, which we found that it can satisfy nearly all this requirement here. And this material is called cellulose. Cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer on earth. It widely existing in wood, plants, uh, grasses, and also can be produced by bacteria. Uh, in terms of a material property, Cellulose is strong. Its intrinsic strength can reach five to seven gigapascal. It's stiff and also lightweighted. The density of cellulose is around 1.2 gram per cubic centimeter, which is six to seven times smaller than steel. It is very cheap because it's abundant there. And it is a biomaterial, so naturally it's sustainable. Now, if you plot this famous Ashby plot with y-axis as the specific stiffness, x-axis the specific strength, cellulose is right here. It is superior than most of the engineering materials you can find over there. Metals, composite, um, polymers, plastics, okay? So I'll use the rest of the time to cover three topics. In the first topic, uh, I'm going to introduce some uh, uh, bottom bottom up mechanics design um, we worked on in the past few years. It leads to a fundamental material design uh, mechanism to allow you achieve both strength and toughness. And with that fundamental designing mechanism, in the part two and part three, I'm going to share some research progress on potential end applications. The first one will be the potential replacement for steel. Uh, we can make wood stronger than steel, but six times lighter. And also we look into a potential replacement for plastics uh, that are low cost, biodegradable, and also uh, suitable for scalable manufacturing to further drive down cost. Uh, we're looking into the thin films, uh, straws, and the full packaging film. Okay. The first part is the bottom up mechanics design of cellulose materials to defeat the conflict between strength and toughness. So there is a holy grail in the engineering material design that is the conflict between strength and the toughness. So generally, generally speaking, if you have a stronger material, it tends to be more brittle. Now, if you have a tougher material, 
typically this material is not that strong. I typically use the diamond as an example. Imagine you have a big chunk of the diamond. It's arguably one of the strongest material over there. You better keep it that way. Don't drop it on the floor because if you drop it on the floor, it breaks into pieces and your value decreases significantly. That's because the, this very, very strong diamond is very, very brittle. So this trend is as indicated by this arrow is what you see in typical materials. So material scientists has been trying to make the material stronger. One way to do that is to decrease the feature size of the material, like the grain sizes of a metallic uh, polycrystalline metallic material. You can make the material stronger, but typically at the price of the toughness. So it's the smaller, the stronger, but less tougher. I use steel as an example. So these are the product line of US steel company. Uh, this is the strength, yield strength as a function of the ductility, ultimate strength as a function of ductility. You can clearly see this decreasing trend that stronger material, stronger steels, they have lower ductility and higher ductility steel, their strength is lower. And we know that with strength and ductility, you have a, uh, have a strong correlation with toughness. So you, this corresponding to this decreasing trend between strength and toughness. Now, this increasing trend, which is the smaller, the stronger and tougher, is the desirable scaling law we want, but it is not easy to achieve. People actually tried uh, many things uh, to demonstrate this uh, solution to defeat the conflict here. For example, in nanocrystalline metals, people introduced these hierarchical nano twins to achieve both strong and tough metals. In bulk metallic gas, we know it's very strong, but it typically is um, it's brittle. People can manage to in, in, introduce this dendrite growth to increase the toughness as well. And learning from the nature, and um, people may make the structure of nature to use the strong but brittle mineral platelet and embedded in the protein matrix to make strong and tough materials. This all works in these specific materials. However, oftentimes this solution like the nano twins can only be applicable for metallic materials, similar thing like the dendrite growth. So a general mechanism or design guidelines to defeat the conflict of strength and toughness is still uh, remain as a challenge. So we looked into this, uh, it all started with a piece of paper. This is the part I really missed uh, you know, the in-person presentation with the all live audience in front of you. So now if you, if you have a piece of paper, no matter it's a printing paper or a tissue paper, uh, uh, you grab it, you tear it, okay? Once you tear it, um, if you look at the fuzzy uh, 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 fractured surface, you will see all these fibers. Those are actually the wood fibers uh, uh, the paper is made of. They have diameter around 20 to 30 microns. It's similar to human hair. Now there are existing uh, recipes and mainly it's uh, chemistry procedures allow you to break down the, these microfibers down to very, very fine nanofibers and the cellulose nanofibers. Indeed, we can achieve 1000 times decrease of this diameter. And then we use this cellulose nanofiber to make a piece of paper. First of all, this cellulose nanopaper becomes transparent because the building block has a diameter smaller than the wavelength of all visible lights. More interesting, if you cut a piece of this cellulose nanopaper, do a tensile test, which is shown in plot B here, stress versus strength. The dark curve here corresponding to the regular paper made of 25 micron thick uh, cellulose fibers. You see that it breaks fractures around 2.5% of strength and with a very low strength, about single digit to 10 megapascal at most. Now, if you break down the diameter of the cellulose fiber 1000 times to 28 nanometer, and you make this cellulose nanopaper. And you can see that 
The ductility increased modestly. However, the strength increased substantially, more than 200 megapascal. You further decrease the diameter of the cellulose nanofiber to 20 nanometer. You see that it becomes more ductile and even stronger. The thinnest one we achieved is 11 nanometer. It can be stretched more than 8%, reach a strength around 260 to 70 megapascal. Now, if you integrate the area below the curve, that is the uh, work of a fracture. And if you plot the, the tensile strength and the work of a fracture here, this will be the natural, the typical paper you have, thick fiber. And these three data points are the nano paper made of uh, much finer uh, uh, cellulose nanofibers. You clearly see this increasing trend so by decreasing the building block size, you increase the strength and the toughness simultaneously. We also did the fracture toughness uh, measurement and the difference between the regular paper to the nano paper is more than 10 times as well. So this is the desirable scaling law, although it's not typical. And the increase is not small. So strength here increased 40 times and the work of fracture increased 130 times, okay? So this clearly demonstrated that, that by decreasing the building block size, you can defeat the conflict between strength and toughness in paper. Now, of course, you don't want to stop here. You want to understand why, okay? To understand the, de the increase of strength as the function of decreasing diameter of the fiber, we build up a, a fracture mechanics model. And surprisingly, this fracture mechanics model fits very well over the three orders of magnitude of the diameter here, as you can see is gray line. And it shows that the strength is proportional to one over the square root of the diameter. So this can be understood as the following. So when we decrease the building block uh, size, the uh, fiber diameter, you naturally decreasing the defect size in the, in the paper. By decreasing the defect size, we know that the strength of the material increases and it falls very well into this fitting curve. Now, next question is, is that because the building block size becomes smaller, then the material becomes tougher? The answer is no. We actually did the control experiment to show this. Now, this is a film made of carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotube, we know that is arguably one of the strongest material over there in the world. The question is, if you are using the strongest fiber, carbon nanotubes, to make a piece of paper, are you making the strongest paper in the world? The answer is no. As you can see that, we used the carbon nanofiber bundles of the diameter about 10 nanometer, trying to compare with our best performing nano paper. So you are comparing apple to apple. So this is our nano paper pencil stress strain curve. And this is a carbon and the tube film. It is stronger, the carbon and the uh, tube film in comparison with the natural paper, the uh, typical regular paper. However, you see that it becomes more brittle. So it, this shows that you are using the similar building block size. However, you have very different stress strain behavior of the two material. So it tells you that by being small, it's not enough to being tough. To understand why this nanocellulose nano paper is also tough and strong, uh, you need to look into the hierarchical structure of the, uh, the cellulose fiber. So this is cellulose fiber at around uh, the, the, like a piece of wood. If you further zoom in, this is at the scale where you have the fibers in your regular paper, printing paper. But if you go in downward, you will see the cellulose nanofibers uh, shown here. This is a high resolution TM images here. The cellulose nanofiber is made of many cellulose molecular chain. And this shows the repeat unit of the cellulose molecular chain. You can see, as I shown and highlighted here, there are many hydroxyl groups on the surface of the cellulose molecular chain. There are six in each repeating unit. As you can imagine that there are abundant 
these hydroxyl groups on the surface of cellulo, uh, cellulose molecular, molecular chains. So when they are close by to each other, we know that the hydroxyl group, when they're approaching each other, they naturally form hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is not the very strong bond in comparison with ionic bond, the metallic bond, uh, uh, the covalent bond. However, they are easy to form. So if you put these two OH groups close to each other, they naturally form and they can reform, which means that when this OH group is moving to another neighboring OH group, they naturally form a new hydrogen bond, okay? So with this in mind, we envision the deformation and the failure mechanism of the cellulose nanopaper. Now, when you try to stretch the cellulose nanopaper in a tensile test, the individual cellulose chain won't be breaking because we know that the principle, the, uh, the intrinsic st strength of cellulose chain is very high, several gigapascal. Instead, the way it fractures is through this interfilament or interchain sliding relative to each other. So as you can imagine that they already form a lot of this hydrogen bond when before you stretch and fracture this material. When you try to deform this material, it is the relative sliding, for example, as illustrated here, the middle chain is sliding away from the surroundings. You can imagine that in this process, the fracture involves a cascade of hydrogen bond breaking and the reforming event. And of course, this atomistic scale failure mechanism and deformation mechanism is hard to observe and verify in the experiment, but we can get some indirect evidence from nanoscale. So this is the SEM image of the cellulose nanopaper as made, as you can see that the cellulose nanofibers are really random, randomly distributed in the plane. However, when you fracture this, fracture this piece of nanopaper, look at the fracture surface, you see this very well aligned uh, cellulose nanopaper, uh, nanofibers, which is basically you start with, with, with a random distribution of the uh, network of the cellulose fibers. When you start to slide and then the fracture, the naturally form this aligned uh, profile. To get this, to verify the uh, atomistic uh, deformation and the failure mechanism, we use the molecular dynamic simulations. So we simulate seven cellulose chain here. This is the end of view. So we let the middle one to slide off from the surrounding. So if you view from the top, I'm not plotting the top two and the bottom two, just plotting the middle three for visual clarity here. So you pull this out among the six and this B curve plotted the energy variation as a function of the sliding displacement. You can see that when you start to slide, the energy curve increases. You can imagine all this hydrogen bond formed between the hydroxyl groups as, a, as many little springs, right? When you st start to slide, you are stretching the springs and then the energy, strain energy, uh, increases. Now, when it peaks, if you further slide, it drops. The reason for that is, if you look at this hydrogen bond, when you slide, this top OH group is moving toward the right. When it's too far away, this little sprint is broken. So it's broken, so it caused the drop of the curve. But the curve doesn't go down to zero because once this OH group left this OH group, it will meet another new OH group and form another hydrogen bond. Another new spring is formed. So when you further slide, this energy picks up. So this happens many times during the sliding process. So this clearly captured this deformation and the failure mechanism we envision. So which is the hydrogen bond forming, breaking, and the reforming. And in terms of the zigzag nature of the energy variation. So as illustrated here, during this sliding process, there were many cascade events of hydrogen bond formation, breaking and reformation in these two boxes until uh, it slides off. So although each individual hydrogen bond is not that strong, but breaking it many times, if you add it up, that leads to a high energy consumption. So that leads to the uh, higher toughness. Now with this 
understanding of the toughening mechanism, we actually tried this mechanism in other materials. So here's one example I want to share with you. So the bronze part, brown part here is the graphene oxide. They are the two dimensional flakes. And they can, you can use the graphite, uh, graphene oxide to make a, a fiber, high performance, high strength. But you can also get the cellulose nanofibers in it as shown as this green fibers. It's long, like the long thread is threading through all these two dimensional flakes. Let me show you the stress strain curve of the three different group of fibers. We make the fiber purely using graphene oxide. Here, this is the dark curve. This is just pure graphene oxide fiber. We also make a fiber made of a pure cellulose, nanocellulose, which is the red curve, okay? If you call this curve A, material A, which is pure graphene oxide, and pure NFC is material B. Now, if you mix A and B, typically if you mix A and B, you get something in between, right? So not, uh, not better than both. However, when we hybridize the graphene oxide with NFC, we make a fiber, we found that this composite fiber is both stronger and also tougher because it dissipated more energy to fracture it. To understand why, let's do, I'll show you in uh, uh, two slides to explain. First, why this hybridized microfiber is better than just the pure graphene oxide. Then I'll explain why this one is better than the pure NFC one. Now, if you have just a pure graphene oxide, you make a fiber. The, on the surface of graphene oxide, they do have functional groups to allow them to form hydrogen bond, but there is only a limited number of hydrogen bonds can be formed. However, by introducing the cellulose nanofiber in between, we know that, as I showed previously, that there were a lot of very rich hydroxyl groups on the surface of cellulose nanofiber. So these significantly increased the bonding sites in the material to form the hydrogen bond. And this additional hydrogen bond uh, bonding site provided by the NFC offered a stronger interlayer interactions. And we also verified this using the molecular dynamic simulation. This shows that the hybrid one is better than the pure graphene oxide one. Then you may ask, okay, what if I just use the pure cellulose? then wouldn't you get a more uh, 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 hydrogen bond formation? Here, I want to make an analogy here, okay? So this NFC is just like a bowl of spaghetti noodles, okay? Now, if you slide the two spaghetti noodles away from each other, once they slide off each other, they're gone. They're not interacting with each other, right? And this hybrid one, I want to make an analogy. You can imagine it's like you are using two pieces of pizzas to sandwich a lot of spaghetti noodles, okay? Now, in this case, when the two spaghetti noodles are not interacting with each other anymore, they are still interacting with the pizza above and below. So in this case, you can have larger size graphene oxide flakes can in turn provide extra bonding sites between the NFC chains over a much longer distance. So that's why the hybrid one is better than the pure NFC one. So I hope with this uh, uh, so far, um, I demonstrate that a fundamental mechanism to defeat the conflict between toughness and the strength. The key here is to allow the hydrogen bond, although it's not the strongest bond over there, to form, to break, and to reform. And this fundamental mechanism is actually applicable to other material systems uh, there. And indeed, there are many, many ways you can functionalize the surface of the building blocks to allow this uh, deformation mechanism to occur. Let me migrate to the second part. Uh, second part is a super strong and tough wood directed from bulk natural wood through a simple top-down uh, process. The motivation here is now, after some time, uh, we work on this uh, uh, cellulose uh, nanopaper and uh, other materials. We realized so that the, we, we need to first break down the micro-sized fiber down to nanofiber, okay? And keep in mind those microfibers of wood 
are first broken down by breaking down the uh, bulk wood, right? The bulk wood is already there. So all this process takes a lot of energy. Okay? Then we ask ourselves, do we really need to break down them all the way? Or can we go back, flip the, the model to do a top-down approach? Which means that you start with a piece of chunky natural wood. Over there, you have all the building blocks you want, and they are actually well aligned inside the natural wood. Can you build a stronger and tougher material using natural wood? And this way you can save a lot of energy. And meanwhile, the end product is, is already a uh, 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 microscopic structural material. And this also overcome another challenge, the scaling up manufacturing of nanomaterials. Oftentimes the nanomaterials, they have high performance, but if you really want to go to real applications, uh, mass production is a challenge. Okay, so we started with a piece of natural wood. We do two steps. In the first step, we do a chemical treatment. There are three compositions in natural wood, cellulose, lignin, and hemicellulose. The chemical treatment partially removes the lignin. Lignin is the component that makes the uh, remain the rigidity of the natural wood. By removing partially the lignin, the wood becomes soft. And then we perform the second step, which is a densification process. We can show that you can significantly reduce the thickness of the wood by 80%. So this is a natural block of wood uh, with a height of uh, a thickness of a 44 millimeter. After densification, it, it is only uh, a 9.5 millimeter. And we maintain the alignment of the nanocellulose fiber uh, in, in the natural wood. Indeed, this further densification make this alignment even better. Let's see the performance of this material. After densification, the densified wood has a higher density than natural wood, but it's still very low, around 1.3, 1.4 gram per cubic centimeter, which is much lighter weighted than many other metals. So this is the specific strength of densified wood. It's many times higher than the natural wood, but also is higher than triplex. It's a typical alloy, aluminum alloy, which is widely used in aerospace industry, the high strength stainless steel, and also titanium alloy. Titanium alloy is arguably one of the best performing material alloy with high specific strength. And the densified wood has a specific strength even higher than that. So here I show the mechanical properties of densified wood. This is a stress strain curve. Uh, this is natural wood and this is the densified wood. And there is a 12 times increase of the tensile strength, the absolute strength when we were publishing the, the, the data it was around 550 megapascal. That's already stronger than some lower grade steel. I know that we know that steel has a very large range of the uh, distribution of the strength depending on the composition. And the work of fracture increased 10 times. In terms of the stiffness, there were 11 times of increase. We actually tried almost everything we can, uh, we can, we can do to test the mechanical property of this piece of densified wood. The scratch hard hardness increased 30 times. The impact uh, toughness measured by the Sharpie test increased 8.5 times. The hardness modulus increased 13 times. Now, if you compare the absolute strength of densified wood with typical plastic, because the density of the uh, of, uh, densified wood is 1.2, 1.3, it's very typical comparable to typical plastics, ABS, uh, PC, polystyrene, nylon, uh, epoxy, as you can see that the, the, the strength is significantly higher and sometimes is more than one order of magnitude higher than those materials. And densified wood maintained the anisotropic behavior of natural wood. So which means that when you stretch perpendicular to the wood fiber direction, uh, it is still weak. Although, uh, as you can see this curve, the red one is a densified wood, it's, uh, it's much stronger than the natural wood in the lateral direction, but it's, it's, it's low, it's, it's around 50 micropascal. So we 
laminate the two layers of densified wood in 90 degree. So this is going this way. The bottom piece is fiber is going this way. And this by layer, if you do the tensile test, uh, this show a rather similar tensile behavior in two perpendicular directions with the tensile strength around 200 megapascal, which is not bad at all in comparison with natural wood, still many times higher. Now, of course, we want to know why. So we need to look into the material structure of these two materials to compare. So this is a natural wood. B here shows the end view. If you view from the right or left, you see a lot of these openings, these channels in and and the wood cells here, the big channels, small channel. These serve as uh, you know their biological functions in natural wood during the growth. And not only those. Now, if you look into the sideways from the side, you will see that along the cell wall of the wood, there are a lot of uh, small pits and serve as defects as well. In the next page, I'll show you a better image. Now, after the densification, as you can see, E corresponding to B, imagine that the B is collapsed, pressed from the top to bottom. You can see that all these cell walls, they collapse. And after the collapse, they form this intertwining finger-like structures and uh, really hand in hand. And also not only that, even the small pits on the surface of the cell wall, they disappear. So, and we maintain the alignment of the cellulose nanofibers in the natural wood, and it actually becomes even better. As you can see this higher resolution image here, this is the alignment of the nanoscale alignment of the cellulose fibers also uh, evident here. So here, I think it's a better image as you can see, this is the uh, the two four images I showed in the previous page. If you look at the F, you see these pits, tiny pits on the surface of the uh, of the cell wall. You know, for mechanics people, anytime you see defects, you know something is troublesome. Now, after the densification, you see that even those tiny pits disappear. So we can always uh, all, almost manage to do a full densification of natural wood to remove most of the defects over there. And this is the alignment of the cellulose nanofibers. Now with this well-aligned cellulose nanofibers, when we try to break it, the similar deformation mechanism, as I showed in the previous, in the first section, uh, still hold, right? You have a lot of cascade of a hydrogen, hydrogen bond formation, breaking and uh, reformation and dissipate a lot of energy. So here is the mechanistic understanding of the uh, densified wood. Uh, and we call it the densified wood, but the media, they like to call it super wood. Anyway, so let's call it super wood. So the first step is doing the delinkification to allow you to do a complete densification uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the natural wood. Uh, there were two effects of that. First, the full complete densification removed the defects. Without the, uh, the much of the defect, the strength will be high. And also for the increased the alignment, well-aligned cellulose nanofibers will allow you to have more cellulose uh, interactions among each other form and dissipate more energy through the hydrogen bond breaking uh, and the reforming. So that will lead to a high toughness. So we also did the ballistic uh, resistant test uh, or the absorption test. This is the uh, illustration of the, this is the air gun. It will shoot a steel bullet uh, out of this uh, nozzle and uh, the wood piece will be here. And we have the phantom high-speed camera to take the video. Let me show you the video here. So this is a video taken uh, from the side perpendicular. So the wood sample is here. You cannot really see. I have next slide, I have a, we have another phantom camera from the back, from the side. Uh, you can see the wood samples. So this one is the natural wood piece here. This one is a mono layer of super wood. And the bottom one has five layers of super wood with the alternating orientation, 90 degree width away from each other. But we keep the thickness of all three samples the same. So you can compare apple to apple. So the incoming speed of the uh, uh, bullet, steel bullet is the same. As you can see that for the natural one, wood one, it can easily penetrate through break the piece of the wood, as you can see here. 
And the monolayer of this uh, super wood, it can also penetrate, but you can see that the velocity is lower, which means that this one, super wood, absorb more energy than the natural wood. And if you have this five layer laminate, it can completely absorb the kinetic energy of the bullet and actually trap the bullet here. So this is the uh, phantom camera video uh, from the side. You can see this is the natural wood. Uh, so let me not to go back to here. Okay. You see this is a bullet hitting the sample and cause this opening penetration through and open up the, the wood uh, larger in size than the cross-section of, uh, of the bullet. This is the one layer, monolayer uh, super wood. It can penetrate through and open up, but the opening is smaller. And this is the five layer super wood. As you can see that it can partially penetrate through and the opening is really, really small. And eventually it trapped the bullet there. It's trapped there. And it's, we're not stopping the video as you can see that the debris are still flying and uh, to show that it is fully trapped there. Now, if you characterize the uh, ballistic energy absorption, you show, we can show that there is a 10 times more of ballistic resistance than the natural wood. And also we did the, uh, uh, the uh, core screen the modeling to show that uh, the reason for this uh, uh, significant increase of ballistic resistance uh, comes from this reinforced uh, effect of the alternating fibers in different directions. Superwood is stable under moisture attack. We did the accelerated the test in 95% uh, of the relative humidity for 128 hours. It showed that it does uh, absorb an, uh, uh, water and, uh, and, and, uh, and swell by 8.4%. And there are uh, uh, a modest a decrease of the strength after uh, absorbed uh, water from uh, 548 megapascal to 493 megapascal here. However, this can be easily overcome by doing a very simple surface coating. You just buy this surface anti-water coating from Home Depot, you do a thin coating on it, and then you do the test, it shows nearly nothing absorbed, uh, the water absorption in this surface painted intensified wood. And of course, the mechanical strength doesn't really decrease much. Okay, so we also showed that the, uh, this approach is universal for different wood species. And it holds for oak, poplar, they are the hardwood, and the cedar and the pine, they are the softwood. And it's just a matter of how much times of a difference over there, but there are always a significant increase of the strength and also work of fracture. So uh, this piece of research won us this uh, R&D 100 uh, award in 2018. And currently, we are working uh, with the support of RPAE on this application of light with vehicles. Uh, this is in our dream, and uh, we hope that in the future, this is not just for vehicles. Uh, if you can manufacture this uh, in a large quantity, we hope this can be used for air aerospace and also architectures for as a uh, replacements of steel and other structural materials uh, with the sustainable. Uh, automate. So let me migrate to the third part. I think I'm uh, running short of time. I'll be quick in this part. So in this third part, I want to showcase some of our uh, recent studies on the uh, uh, cellulose-based material composite wood plastic replacement. Uh, this is the industry-funded project, so they always ask us to keep the cost low, so we go cheap, seriously. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, the graphite is the just the, the uh, commercial grade graphite uh, you can buy at low cost. For cellulose, we go really cheap. We go with the bagasse, which is the bio waste after you extract the sugar from sugar cane. Uh, typically, it has no use. People just burn it. So when we ask the company to send us this, they said, how many tons do you need? We, said, we only need uh, uh, some for our research to ship uh, us for free. 
so we can mix these two material. I'll show you how to do it in the next page. And it turns out the material property is pretty good. Uh, this is the specific strength versus the specific toughness. And this material is better than uh, many other engineering materials. Uh, the way it works is we start with graphite. Uh, graphite is cheap, graphene is too expensive. Now we mix the graphite and the cellulose nanofibers in water, just the uh, uh, water, no other chemicals. And the cellulose nanofiber, they are actually carry surface charge. When you do the sonication, and then the cellulose nanofiber will uh, can manage to exfoliate the thick graphite flakes into very thin ones. And we show that we measure that the uh, final thickness of the of the graphite is around three to five layers. And the uh, cellulose uh, nanofibers are wrapping around this uh, uh, very thin uh, graphite flakes. And you can make this very thick slurry and up to a solid content of 20%. And it remains stable for a long time. After this is four liter, after six months, it, it, it's the same. I actually have a bottle of this in my office. It's been there for three years. Every time I open it to show other people, it remains exactly the same thing. You don't really see the you know, uh, separation of the two faces with three faces here. And you can make this uh, in a large scale. And because of the thick uh, nature, uh, the viscosity is high enough. It allows us to print this into a large film. When you dry it, you peel it off, you can make uh, this is like a scarf, like as one 1.2 meter long, 30 meter, uh, uh, 30 centimeter or, or one foot in width, a uh, uh, fabric uh, like thin film. Uh, the property is uniform. We picked the six random locations and tested their properties. They are uh, rather uniform. And in terms of mechanical performance uh, and the cost, uh, recyclability processability and the specific toughness, it is actually, which is shown as the red color here, it is uh, actually better than many other materials. The one thing which is not as good as is the carbon fiber. We know carbon fiber is super, super strong. It has a, st uh, a strength of uh, several gigapascal. Uh, we're not that strong, but you know that the carbon fiber has two limitations. First, it's a one dimensional building block and we can make paper and we can make uh, two-dimensional film. And second, carbon fiber is very, very expensive. Okay? And this is stress strain curve and uh, work of fracture and ultimate tensile strength. You see a uh, uh, significant increase from the pure cellulose uh, film uh, several times. And in comparison with other uh, typical metals, uh, stainless steel, uh, triplex, uh, aluminum alloy, titanium alloy, the specific strength of this composite is very high. And the last, let me show you the next uh, uh, characterization of the fractured surface to uh, offer you some understanding of, uh, of why. As you can see, this is the uh, high, uh, this is the SEM image of, of the fractured surface of this material. You see it is very densified layered structure where you see this a uh, 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 very thin layer of graphite with the cellulose nanofibers wrapping around the, uh, the flakes. And then in this page, I show you the deformation and the failure mechanism of this material. When you try to deform and fail this composite material, we know that the few layer graphite is actually very strong and they won't break easily. So uh, what happened is it's a relative sliding, but all these graphite flakes, they are wrapped around with the cellulose nanofibers. So you have a lot of this similar deformation mechanism, the hydrogen bond formation, uh, breaking and the reformation. And we call it a secondary bonding strategy because although these secondary bonding uh, are not as strong as their primary bondings, ionic, covalent metallic bond, but they can easily form, break and then reform and lead to significant energy dissipation, therefore toughen the material. And this is also verified by the uh, 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 simulation result as well. It is fully recyclable. After you make this film, you can 
put in it back in water and use mechanical stirring. And you can go back to uh, uh, this slurry and use this slurry to cause dry to go, uh, go through this cycle again. Of course, this water stability is a, a double-edged sword. And uh, uh, to mitigate that, we demonstrate that if you coat the surface of this material with a thin layer of anti-water coating, uh, you can actually maintain uh, uh, the mechanical pro property uh, in this accelerated test, 98% of relative humidity for 168 hours. This uh, uh, gray line and the blue line are the uh, uh, before and after you coat the, uh, uh, the, the thin layer of anti-water coating. So you can mitigate this water uh, stability issue. And this coating is so thin that even you coat it with, with, with the, this coating, you can go back to use the mechanical stirring to break that uh, layer of coating to allow you to do the uh, recycling uh, use of the material. Okay, so uh, next part I want to talk about a, uh, 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 something we're doing right now uh, on the foam, trying to replace the styrofoam. Uh, styrofoam is uh, getting uh, uh, to the problem, uh, so called the white pollution, and uh, we use this slurry. Uh, uh, we will try to <laughs> offer a dark solution to a to a white pollution. Um, uh, we can make the foam, uh, and uh, the density of the foam is slightly higher than the uh, polystyrene uh, foam, uh, but it's still very lightweighted. As many people are doing, we put it on the uh, uh, on a, a dandelion, it, it stands, okay. And you can see that this uh, 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 microstructure of the uh, of the, the foam, that you see this very hollow nature of this uh, structure uh, with the very thin layer of this uh, uh, percolating network of this material uh, to allow it has the its shape and also uh, its uh, uh, this impact absorption performance. We did the drop tower test. This is styrofoam. This is the uh, our foam. It turns out that the, the energy absorption of the kinetic energy is actually uh, even better. Um, uh, in terms of the degradability test, uh, the styrofoam, as you can see, six days for the styrofoam is like nothing. It remains like this. It's just getting dirty, and not doing anything in, in terms of degradability. But our foam after uh, six days it collapsed and uh, some of the material are degraded are gone as well. So the last one I want to show you is, uh, is uh, this uh, drinking straws. And uh, this is so small and uh, it's, it's impossible to recycle. So typically this is just one time use. I want to challenge you to imagine how many straws, one time use straws are consumed every day in this country. It's 500 million. That's a lot, enough to circle around the earth 2.5 times. And that's why uh, many merchants like Starbucks and the local government like Washington DC are banning the uh, uh, plastic straws. So we try to uh, offer a better solution because the current, if you go to Starbucks and get the, uh, uh, the replacement uh, straw they're using, which is the paper straw. First of all, it's dark. The reason it's dark is they need to coat the surface with the with a wax layer to uh, make sure it is stable in the drink. And also they need to use the glue to glue the paper together. So which drives up the, the, uh, the cost. So we use the, the microfiber of cellulose mixed with the nanofiber of cellulose to make a piece of film. And then we just roll up because there are a lot of uh, nanofibers of cellulose over there. When they are air dried, they naturally form the hydrogen bond to form the straw. You don't need any adhesive. Now, this, here is the, uh, a bunch of, uh, uh, of uh, straws were made. And the length here of the straw is around 10 centimeters. The diameter is a few uh, 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 millimeters up to uh, one uh, centimeter. Now, this is the SEM of the microfibers. And they are very loose. As you can see, a lot of voids over there. And this is the uh, pure cellulose, a uh, nanocellulose uh, fiber film. And if we mix together, this is the, this one. I should use the laser pointer here. You can see that the nanofibers are really wrapping around the microfibers to form a very dense uh, network. And then we did the flexural test. 
you can see that the, the pure micro, microfiber straw, which is a typical uh, uh, paper straw, has a much lower fractal strength. However, the hybrid one and the pure cellulose nano one, nano cellulose one, is comparable to uh, commercial plastic straws. And in terms of uh, tensile strength, it is also the hybrid one is, uh, is, is, is stronger than the typical plastic one, although it's not as uh, uh, ductile than the plastic one. But in terms of the function of the straw, uh, the mechanical performance is more than enough. Now, what about the water stability? So this is a pure uh, 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 microfiber straw. And in 30 seconds, dip into water, it becomes soft. It, it's not working. And if you have a pure nanofiber straw, it remains stable in water for 30 minutes, but it causes the delamination. Now, if you mix these two together and make this hybrid fiber straw, you can use this in the water, immersed in water for four hours, and it doesn't cause the delamination and it remains stable, okay? This can be explained by this, really by the mechanics design uh, we are uh, trying to incorporate here. Because for the pure micro one, uh, fiber one, the water can weaken along and the capillary effect along this void cause the, the dissociation of the hydrogen bond. So that's why it fills at, uh, in a short time. For the pure cellulose one, the water attack will cause the, the dissociation of hydrogen bond. So that causes the delamination. However, with this hybrid design, even though some of the hydrogen bond are dissociated uh, at, the, uh, at these locations, because of this long microfiber, it protects most of the, uh, the hydrogen bond in between the uh, nanofibers uh, remain intact. So this leads to this uh, better uh, water instability, uh, water stability. We also did the degradation test. Uh, in day 120, now our straw start to break into pieces. Uh, uh, so it definitely is much better than the typical plastic straw. And uh, the performance um, uh, comparison with uh, natural paper and the PLA. PLA is a biological uh, degradable plastics. Uh, it's actually quite expensive. Uh, um, the material we demonstrated here is actually uh, overall is better than both. Okay, so let me wrap up uh, <laughs> my talk. Uh, so uh, the message I want to deliver today is that a sustainable future calls for a paradigm shifting solution to advance the materials. And hopefully uh, my talk today show you that there exist a fertile opportunities in nature. Of course, the one question is, do we have enough materials to offer this uh, on, uh, replacement uh, materials? Uh, so the question is, uh, how many trees are there in the world? Uh, it's a hard question to answer, but uh, scientists managed to answer this more accurately uh, in the last uh, five years. Let me play a, a short few clip here. How many trees are there in a forest? What about a country? How about in the whole world? The answer, we now know, is that our planet is home to 3.04 trillion trees. That's a lot of zeros. Okay, let me translate this to everyone. Each of us, on average, we own 400 trees. And these 400 trees are actually mature trees, not the seedlings, because the data is coming from the remote sensing, so small tree doesn't count. So if you have 400 mature trees, what can you do out of it? You can do a lot of things. So that's a message I want to deliver today. So for these advanced materials toward the sustainable future, you can do a lot of things. And working with a group of a top uh, uh, wood scientists in the world, we um, published this review paper in Nature Review Materials uh, this year. Uh, feel free to uh, get that paper um, uh, in which we talked about a lot of this uh, um, possible application and how you achieve that. For the topic I covered today, uh, we do have a review paper coming out in advanced materials on the mechanics design in cellulose enabled high performance functional material. We just finished the proof. I believe it uh, will be available pretty soon. So you can find more details and the uh, related uh, 
references in that review paper. And lastly, I want to acknowledge all my uh, collaborators and my colleagues, and my students and postdocs over the years. Uh, I have a very close collaboration uh, with Professor Bing Hu in the material science department in my college. And uh, uh, Jian Wei Song is now a professor at the Xi'an Jiao Tong University. And Chao Ji is a research scientist who is still working with us. Uh, if you see four people very happy at 3 a.m., uh, something must be fun. <laughs> That's after we uh, we finished the, the, our paper rebuttal to nature. We were so confident and happy that and that we, we were submitting a rebuttal that the editor will not resist. Xu <laughs> uh, Zheju is, uh, and also uh, Zheng Jia and uh, the professors and the former student uh, professors at the Zhejiang University. And the Hong Li Zhu is a rising star at the Northeastern University, a former postdoc, uh, Dr. Xi Zheng, uh, Wang Yubing Zhou are still working with us, um, a postdoc, Ben Qianpang, my PhD student, Wu Pamani Ray, and a former student, uh, uh, Cheng, and the Yinghua Bao is joining the faculty of Shanghai University. Uh, we worked with my colleague, uh, Hugh Brock, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Bill Forney on the mechanical test. And Ashley Martini at the UC Merced, uh, Dr. J.Y. Zhu at the USDA, and also uh, our collaborator and friend, Dr. Jun Lo at Rice University. And I also acknowledge uh, uh, NSF, APA E, and also Trinity for their financial support. Uh, I think I'll stop here and uh, uh, I'll use my speaker's privilege uh, to advertise a little bit here. And uh, uh, for some of you, in probably noticed that recently I started this uh, blog. I do a daily update trying to share uh, some tips of uh, doing research with the uh, people uh, around the world. Of course, uh, <laughs> this uh, you, you need to understand the Chinese because all my videos are in Chinese, but this might be a motivation for you to learn Chinese. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. So all the panelists, could I ask you to all turn on your videos so that we can have a lively discussion? So if you want to ask a question, so please, you can either physically raise up your hand or just click the uh, handshake button on your screen to virtually raise up your hand. And if anyone in the pan, uh, I mean, in the audience want to ask a question, so you have to click handshake button. Then Zhigang can promote you to the uh, panelist to ask questions. And when asking questions, uh, please, uh, if necessary, please say your name and your institution. Uh, thank you. So I think we can start with uh, maybe uh, Professor Polino. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank a uh, very nice uh, talk. Uh, I think your talk has the three eyes that in general I communicate with my colleagues. Uh, is inspirational, uh, informative, and impressive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, I have several questions, but I will communicate with you by email. I'll just ask a couple of very quick uh, questions. Uh, regarding uh, the first uh, two parts uh, where you presented uh, this uh, fascinating uh, material, one question that I have is uh, you talked about uh, a, a lot about the strength, toughness, and uh, how to improve those properties. Uh, but since you indicated that uh, you also want to do maybe cars, uh, airplanes, or buildings, there is a property that is fundamental, is a fatigue. Have you investigated the fatigue, uh, especially high cycle <laughs> fatigue and a low yeah. cycle fatigue? Both, both are extremely important for uh, applications. You are definitely right. And uh, the reason I'm not reporting that part is because that's a, a, quite a challenging uh, uh, experiment to do. Uh, this is something ongoing we're doing. I hope I can report in the future that the, the challenge I can tell you is um, uh, to make the fatigue test samples. Uh, if you, you, the typical way you do the fatigue test, uh, the sample size, because you need to do that, for example, if you want to do this uh, uh, bending test, you rotate uh, a rod over many cycles. Um, we uh, kind of have some challenge making the samples to for fatigue test. And uh, the constraint is in two ways. 
uh, it's uh, the limitation we have in terms of the equipment we have to, to do the fatigue test. Uh, and then and within the limit uh, uh, of our equipment, what kind of sample we need. So, but this is something ongoing. Yeah, I agree with you. It's actually very, very important. And that's the, uh, uh, the, the immediate thing I can think of. And, uh, and that's something we're doing right now. Okay, thank you. Keep me posted. Uh, sure, and, sure, sure. Then uh, the final question uh, that I have, uh, it's very quick. I was very impressed uh, about uh, the forms uh, and the way that uh, you do the forms. And uh, one question that uh, I have is the following. Uh, do you have uh, any freedom in, I saw that uh, as usual, uh, your form, uh, the microstructure is uh, very random, but uh, do you have any freedom or uh, any way to engineer the microstructure? Uh, I think uh, that would be fascinating because uh, once you can uh, engineer the microstructure, then uh, you may be able to get even more extreme uh, properties. And uh, probably you may read my mind, uh, I am thinking about the uh, origami uh, type microstructure at the micro nano scale. And that's uh -huh. a work we published this week. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's, that's my thinking process. Yeah, that's actually a very uh, good point. I think that's that's actually very interesting. If you can manage to control, uh, we have we have some control. To be honest, it's uh, not easy because we try to control that uh, at that scale. There are actually two levels, a two <laughs> length scale of control you need to achieve. First is the size of the pores, right, and the distrib distribution of the pores. Second thing is the thickness of the of the wall. These two overall together determine the, the, the overall mechanical property of the final material. Yes. We have some control because this has something to do with chemistry. We're still learning, you know, I'm trained as a mechanics person. And I, I, when I'm forced to learn all this chemistry, uh, we're still learning. Uh, we have some control of this, uh, but, but I think you raise a very good point that if you can have a rather tunable control of this, then you can have a piece of material with controlled, for example, stiffness at different locations. That will be terrific. I think that will be, for example, for origami, it will be very desirable if you have a continuum material with different, uh, you know, at the at the hinge. You want the the bendable is not, uh, and yeah. So uh, uh, I don't have a good answer to you, but I think there are quite some rooms over there to explore. Thank you, thank uh, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, next one, um, maybe uh, Professor Yu Hang Hu. Uh, Yu Hang, are you Sorry, there? I forgot to un unmute myself. Sorry. Hey, Tang, thank you for the great talk from the uh, grand uh, challenging, uh, global challenging problem to detail the mechanics. I really enjoy it a lot and I learned a lot as well. So if I may, I would like to ask uh, two questions. So the first is, uh, so in your stress strain uh, uh, measurement or simulation that you showed, it's uh, only one uh, uh, loading, right? Have you uh, done a cyclic loading? How about the hysteresis and uh, uh, reversible deformation? Uh, yeah, maybe for uh, the first question, uh, uh, First, yeah. Yeah, so the, for the material I presented today, uh, 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 the typical experiment we do is uh, 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 the monotonic loading, uh, for example, tensile test or bending test, as uh, 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 Glossio asked previously. We are, we are doing the fatigue test and the cyclic loading for these uh, uh, strong and tough materials, but we did the cyclic loading test for other cellulose-based wood-based materials, they are actually more like a foam, like a sponge, uh, uh, or sometimes it's a combination of hydrogel and the sponge behavior. Um, there, you do see the cyclic loading behavior over there, but that's something we are starting to do. Um, and also um, that's part of the reason I'm not presenting the data. It, we don't have a very good understanding of uh, those hysteresis, 
hysteresis, hysteresis uh, behavior of this material. Uh, but I think uh, it's more relevant for those uh, more elastic, uh, 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 soft uh, uh, derivative of cellulose materials. For the strong and tough materials, the hysteresis, I expect it's not, not much. Yeah. Although I'm not quite sure. We don't have the data. Yeah. How about the elastic string range? How much oh. elastic string you can get? Okay, so I actually showed in the uh, uh, in the slide. So for the uh, uh, densified wood, it's actually still quite brittle. I think that's the one of the drawback we have. Uh, it increased the strength of the natural wood a lot by 10 times, 11 times, but it doesn't increase the ductility much. And sometimes it's even slightly lower, but natural wood, the ductility is low anyway. So this is one of the drawback it has in comparison with, for example, steel, aluminum, they are actually very ductile. So this is also something uh, we are trying to improve or overcome now. I think that's another very open area. And I, I want to challenge people in the audience or other, other people uh, to demonstrate. Uh, but for the cellulose film, uh, if you break down them into uh, fibers and make the uh, film, uh, we can achieve around uh, eight to 10% uh, of ductility, uh, which is uh, um, still lower than the typical plastics. Uh, but there are many scenarios you can use uh, the plastic okay. without much of the ductility needed. Yeah, so uh, a second question is uh, somehow related. So in your talk, you demonstrate a lot of a beautiful performance, like uh, improve the strength, the toughness, uh, and uh, water resistance, uh, recyclability, and also printability. And uh, so my question is, uh, so in your uh, wish list out of this uh, uh, material system, what's the next things that you would uh, um, uh, imagine that uh, uh, are feasible to improve and demonstrate out of this uh, system? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. And this is something I learned uh, and almost in a daily base. And uh, this is something uh, many years ago when I was trying to do mechanics research, not really pay much attention to that is, uh, I think the challenge and also the opportunity is uh, to, uh, to do the scaling up manufacturing. Because if you cannot scale up the manufacturing, these ideas will just stay in the lab. I won't fly eventually lead to the application of these materials to really replace either metals or plastics. Yeah. Thank you. And indeed there are many fundamental scientific problems you can work on to do the scalable manu manufacturing. <laughs> Hey, Jen, you muted yourself. I'm sorry. So next one will be Professor David Weiss. Hi, hey, Dave. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Fantastic talk. <laughs> I loved you. it. It's really Thank great. You. I learned a lot. I have a lot of questions, but I have one in particular. Um, what I learned from you is to um, make something really valuable you take um, rod-like structures, you join them together with a bond that can give and reform, give and reform. And that's really good for increasing tensile properties. My question to you is what about bending energy? Because if I bend things over large enough uh, scale, then I have to have, I can have things slip. If they slip, then the bending energy is not, doesn't go up that much. If they're really permanently bound, bonded, then, uh, I, the bending energy goes up, uh, you know, the, the square of the area or whatever. So uh, can you uh, say something about bending energy in addition to tensile properties? Sure, sure. Actually, I was debating to cut different slides and so I did have the bending test of the, for example, the super wood, uh, uh, but I put it in the, uh, <laughs> the backup slide. Uh, so I can explain this. So um, the bending, and the twisting, for example, this is something also I learned from 
<laughs> Qigong. So uh, the most de demanding deformation is still tensile uh, loading. Now, if you bend the immaterial, then you know, the outer side is under tension and the inner side is under compression, right? So naturally, if you have a material is very uh, uh, deformable or it's, uh, it's, it's durable in tension, under bending, it, the performance won't be too bad. So uh, in, the, in the slide I didn't show, uh, we actually tested the, the bending strength of the super wood in comparison with the natural wood. It shows the similar improvement. Actually, one interesting aspect it is, in the natural wood, we know that it is so anisotropic that it's really hard to fracture the wood along the fiber direction. However, when you try to break a piece of wood, it's the easiest thing to do is try to break in the vertical direction. You bend it, right? You flex it, it the, 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 the wood fractures along in between the wood fibers. Now, when we densify the wood, we tested the bending strength of that direction. It actually shows a significant increase enhancement, increased around 20 to 30 times, which means that, okay, the resulting uh, super wood is still anisotropic, but is not as weak as the natural wood in the lateral direction. Because when you are using the material, it's not that the strongest direction matters, it's the weakest direction matters. So by densification, and you increase this weakest strength actually a lot. So in that case, I think it answers your question, hopefully, that uh, the bending uh, uh, resistance or the, the strength is actually uh, as good or even better than the tensile. Thanks so much. You answered my question. You also uh, implied that, I, again, as always, I should talk to Zhigong to learn more as well. <laughs> I Thank always you, learn thanks. from him. Yeah. I know me from too. You. Me too. Believe me. I, me too. Yeah. I, I thank you for uh, opening up your group uh, meetings back in the days so over there. And thanks for all those free pizzas. <laughs> Give me the inspiration <laughs> of the Such a cheap of the thing. <laughs> Such a cheap thing. <laughs> That's the thanks so much. That was, that was great, really. Thank Fantastic. you. Can, can I, uh, can I uh, uh, introduce uh, one of my colleagues here? Uh, uh, Dan Cosgrove, um, there. Hey, Dan. So I've been working with Dan on cellular uh, uh, growth and formation. And Dan uh, is a uh, 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 cellular director uh, for Energy Frontier of DOE. And I think his uh, center renewed three times. And I think that most of his research is focused on cellular growth. So, so this is a very uh, much uh, uh, related to what Tain uh, research. Uh, uh, Dan, would you, can you say something about your center and uh, your? Yeah, thanks, Sulin. Uh, yeah. Professor Lee, thanks very much for that talk. It was, it was quite wonderful. And uh, there were so many uh, parallels in the way you're thinking about the um, uh, stress strain and, and deformation of mature woody materials. Uh, with how we're thinking about how plant cell walls grow in, in the biological context. And it involves, it involves slippage, we believe. Uh, I'm collaborating with Professor Zhang right now with a, a model of that slippage in the context of, of, uh, of, of biology, uh, how plant cell walls enlarge and grow. And, and uh, I also want to mention just quickly so, so our center, our, our DOE center, is focused on, it's called the Center for Lignocellulose Structure and Formation. And it has a lot, it's focused principally on how plants make this complex hierarchical material and the physical uh, and structural aspects of that. So your talk uh, is exploring some of the wonderful be behaviors of cellulose and how one can uh, tune that to attain some some uh, new properties that are very useful. I, I found that very interesting. Thank you, thank you, Professor Cosgrove. I heard a lot from uh, about you from Sudin, and thank you for stopping by and joining the the talk. And uh, I, I I would argue that uh, probably the 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 you are the 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 expert in the audience with the most of us <laughs> knowledge on this material than <laughs> anyone else here. And hopefully <laughs> I didn't see anything 
uh, too wrong about this material. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, there were no red flags. It was, it was quite wonderful. From, I'm a, I'm a plant biologist, so uh -huh. I come, I come to this material with a very different perspective, and uh, so it's, it's quite, it's quite enlightening to see your perspective, and uh, to see how it overlaps with, the, with the way we are, uh, we are coming to, to view it. So there's, a, I think there's a lot of. Uh, common principles in the way plants have uh, over over uh, many hundreds of millions of years of evolution have, have designed this material for for special properties, not only strength, but the ability to slide in a controlled fashion to allow the walls to extend by uh, during cell growth, for example, as well as to sustain bending and all those kinds of motions. So so that's quite wonderful. I also want to put a plug in for one thing. Uh, I'm a plant biologist and, and we've been studying these proteins called expansins, which facilitate the slippage of cellulose microfibrils. Again, in, a, in, in wet cellulosic materials in a, in a biological context. And it's still a major mystery as to how they work. They, they're not enzymes, they facilitate the slippage and uh, there's still a lot of physical uh, unknowns about the molecular mechanism of action. Uh, they potentially have applications in the material science field too. So I just wanted to throw that idea out there that, that these proteins, we call them wall loosening proteins, uh, may have some interesting um, uh, concepts to offer the material scientists. Sounds great. Sounds great. I, I, I really, I hope in the near future, I can visit your center and your lab and uh, let's, let's talk. That would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I just, Thank I you. just received a, a email from Daniel, uh, Dan, that to invite you to come over to give a talk in, our, uh, in his center, folks. Sure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Great. It has to be yeah. a virtual talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, after, after this uh, COVID-19. You know. That'll be too late. <laughs> Pessimist. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, great. So next one will be uh, Jian Yu. But before you start, uh, Zhigang asked me to remind all the panelists, uh, please say your name and institution before you ask questions. Uh, thank you. So next one, Jian Yu. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chen, for, for this kind of uh, very informative and inspiring talk. I think it's just like your WeChat channels. We, we really enjoy that. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Chen Yu Li. So I'm from McGill University uh, in Canada. So I have a question regarding like the plasticity of the, the wonderful material you develop. I think you have touched like the strength, toughness, and many ingredients of the mechanics. I think plasticity is relevant in the context. If you want to replace it, the plastic, right? The plastic has two types, a thermostat and a thermoplastic. The nice thing about thermoplastic, you can simply heat it or you can reshape it to different uh, shape, a complex shape. It's just like the metal, right? Metal has plasticity, you can shape it in, into different uh, geometry. But for your system, I just wonder uh, how, how easy you can do that or do you have to really go again, the solution process? But in that process, you consume another, a lot of energy. So, so yeah, from this aspect, how you can address this kind of issue. Yeah, that's actually a very good aspect of the uh, looking into this, in, into this material. I can use this, uh, 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 for example, cellulose nanopaper and the, the, the derivatives uh, you can mix with other materials like graphite and uh, graphite uh, oxide. Uh, the resulting material, uh, and the ductility is, is uh, not too bad, uh, uh, but it's not as, large as the, for example, the uh, thermoplastics. Um, it can reach around eight, sometimes 10%. Uh, uh, we're trying to improve this as well. Uh, the, in terms of a plastic deformation, uh, if you deform to that range of strength, it definitely it, 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 the yields. And uh, uh, because when, when you slide this relative to each other, uh, it, it, there was no way they naturally go back to the original shape, right? Uh, but it dissipated energy during during this sliding. So in that sense, it is a plastic deformation. Uh, I would argue it's more like toward the, the thermal plastics uh, because the, the bonding between them is not uh, those primary bondings. Uh, 
essentially the uh, the um, uh, the secondary bondings. And it's always that you need to strike the balance between these two. This is this is something we are still learning and trying to understand that the balance between the secondary bonding and the primary bonding. Uh, that also leads to this uh, conflict between strength, uh, strength and uh, uh, toughness. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to beat around the bushes, not really know how to answer your question. <laughs> Hopefully that offers some information. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. May, okay. may I add to that question? I think it's a very interest, uh, interesting question. So when you densify the wood, can you densify it into different shape? Okay, so for, for metals you can cast. That's why it's easy to fabricate. But can you densify into different shapes just you know, by pressing it with a mold? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, we actually demonstrate that. Uh, you can do that uh, with different mode. So if you want to uh, you know, have a step or, because after the first step of the uh, delignification, the wood becomes very uh, floppy and soft, can really conform to different shapes. If a mold, you will be able to mold it and densify it into the final compact shape. The sh longer answer is, as you can imagine that this actually poses some challenge for the, as I mentioned, the scalable manufacturing. Because you need to have a mold of a certain shape, uh, which is actually, uh, in terms of a uh, manufacturing cost is not easy. If you, if you look into the, uh, for example, automobile industry, their uh, uh, production line, uh, all these bumpers, for example, so the shape of the bumpers of the same manufacturing remain nearly the same for many, many years, at least for certain life. Uh, one of the reasons is try to reduce the cost because in the industry size, you try to come up with a new totally new design of the of the mode, uh, the cost is, uh, 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 is high. And also trying to find the best operating conditions to fit the new mode is also takes time and the cost. So the short answer is uh, that's a challenging, that's challenging, but you can mold to different shapes. Yes. Yeah, that's what the uh, plastic industry does all the time. Yeah, exactly. That's something it's hard to beat with the plastics so far. And because uh, for plastics, as Jian Yu mentioned, for thermal plastics, uh, you know, increase the temperature above the glass transition temperature, you can mold into different shapes easily. Uh, yeah, at very low cost, low cost. Something about the plasticity of cellulose. So I was told the wrinkles, the clock, Form wrinkles. That wrinkle is a uh, essentially slippage of a hydrogen bond between cellulose fibers, and you can iron it. When you iron it, you cause plastic deformation, it becomes flat. Is that? Yeah, I, I, we we didn't look into this wrinkles in the fabric, but I, I I would agree with the 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 explanation. That's because of the this uh, slippage of the uh, fibers because once they they, they slip away from each other, it cannot go back. And then then when it, it's dried or after you wash the clothes and when it's dried, it, it naturally shrink and it causes a wrinkle. And, and as mechanics people, we know this. And when you try to iron it, and uh, I think you uh, increase the, uh, the activation energy, allow the fibers to rearrange, right? trying to go back and then in a more densified or more aligned a, a, a configuration, so then the recalls are gone. So, and the, 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 the another uh, feature of this is uh, it's relatively easy to reform and rearrange uh, in comparison, sharp comparison with primary bond. For example, if you have a piece of ceramics, you break it, you really need to go back to thousands of degrees C to melt them and to do the, to reform the the, the, the ionic bond, the covalent bond uh, uh, for those primary bond to heal the <clears throat> fracture. So um, that's, I think, the another beauty of the secondary bond extraction. 
French. Hey, so I have a question. <laughs> a very general question. I just uh, <laughs> exam. I just checked uh, online Amazon for uh, this general plastic straw. For each straw is a pro approximately one cent per straw. If you have a paper straw, it's roughly a general paper straw is roughly two cents per straw. If you have a biodegradable, uh, uh, I think it's also paper straw, it's roughly three cents uh, per straw. Okay, so it's a it's a costly it's a co it's very costly effect effect. It's very cheap. How would your product be this kind of market? It's hard to be honest. We did this project. Uh... <laughs> Simply for fun, <laughs> uh, uh, but but I, I, as I mentioned that um, uh, the the challenge is the scalable manufacturing. Our raw material is actually very cheap. It's it's bagasse, which is a basically a bio waste. They can ship to you. Uh, I mean, probably just charge you the shipping charge because you help them to get rid of their bio waste. Uh, but more of how do you make the uh, straws out of the baguettes, this manufacturing cost. Uh, in the lab, it's really hard to beat those commercial products. Um, I think this is a very common problem uh, to fight against the plastic pollution. Uh, you probably need not only scientific research, but also some incentives from the uh, administration and to really push this through. Because when we use the plastics, we use that for convenience, right? And without much of the consideration of, okay, the pollution and this, uh, uh, you know, getting into the environment, it, it's, it's, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's somewhat remotely related to everyone, uh, but the convenience it brought to you, uh, it's, it's all of yours. So that's another challenge. I would call it the social challenge. Yeah, uh, this goes to Dan. Dan, do you think that you can grow straw from biochemistry <laughs> point of view? That's, that's essential. The one. word straw itself is for those natural straw you have in, in, in nature. But, uh, you know, do you really want to use that straw? Uh, oh, for if, you grow, if you grow like a tube like thing, right? You just uh, harvest it from the from the land. That would be very cheap and natural. Yeah, plants plants do this all the time. So there are aquatic uh, species that have hollow le hollow stems, and yeah. so it's it's basically like a straw. There's there's many many species that do exactly that. Uh, also, think about bamboo. That's too big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just miniaturize it. You know. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, maybe uh, Professor Spapen. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. It was great to see you. A great talk. It's, in fact, I, it reminds some of this reminds me of the, the interest in, in what we call self healing materials, right? That, that you, what you described is very much, uh, I think, a self healing mechanism on some scale. And I have a couple of questions for you. Um, if you look at natural wood and look at the anisotropic cell structure, the the branches, for example, get a lot of bending stiffness out of that geometry, bending per unit weight, right? So when you then densify this, you lose this. But the question is, can you take your superwood and then restore some of this cellular structure in order to get to gain, uh, again, bending uh, to weight advantage? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well. If, 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 you, okay. if you look by spreading out your material over a larger diameter, of course, you get yeah. you get bending stiffness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you collapse that down, you lose that. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. So the question is, if you now take out the lignin and you get your super stuff, can you now put this back? And can you make a structure that behaves like the, 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 the cells in the branch do to give it uh, this optimal or this very uh, uh, remarkable bending stiffness, right? Yes, yes. Okay. I, that's a very valid uh, point. Actually, I remember that remind me when our paper was uh, first published, uh, there's some uh, researchers uh, uh, in the civil engineering uh, area, the uh, uh, community with the editor and asked a similar question. So I, I think this can be, uh, um, I think you, you can recover certain uh, uh, bending rigidities uh, through structural 
design. For example, you can just like uh, we have the this uh, I shaped beams and H beams, yeah. and you can use the uh, super wood to design uh, 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 certain structures to achieve the uh, uh, desirable uh, bending rigidity. And given that the because the bending rigidity essentially is uh, E multiply I, right? I is a moment of inertia, and this I can be. You're designed by the structural <laughs> structural uh, 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 approach uh, instead of changing the material structure. And so it's E is material, I is a structure. So if you combine them together, I think there are quite some room you can achieve the desirable bending rigidity. My other question had to do with kinetics. That is, how long does it take to take the lignin out of, for example, a cubic centimeter of stuff? And related to that is when you show your pentagon with the cost axis, uh -huh. do you really know all the costs that it will take to make this stuff on the same scale than some of these other materials that you're putting on there? So how that must be a very difficult thing to compute. Yeah, yeah. This is a very, very this is a very typical French question. Very sharp, deep to the <laughs> bottom. Uh, so I feel like I was in the in the in the final exam of uh, two seventy three, two ninety three. But this is all great question. And uh, uh, the uh, kinetics, of the uh, the uh, it's really depending on the uh, diffusion of the chemicals into the material and the reaction at the front. So this actually one of the challenge we are trying to address uh, within this APAE project because uh, it's more about uh, how do you scale up, speed up uh, for this. Uh, so there are some strategies that we are exploring, but uh, the two limiting factors, one is this kinetic uh, kinetics of this uh, uh, delinquification process. A second one, but give give I me would, give, then give, give me a feeling for for one cubic centimeter. How long do you have to lose leave that in the liquid? Okay, it really depends on the how you have this one cubic meter, one cubic meter one of cubic centimeter centimeter a cubic centimeter. Um, if you spread out into a thin plate, no, no, uh, a, cube, a cube in all directions. Cube. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Roughly, is it an hour? Is it a day? Is it a week? No, no. On the, on the order of a hour to with uh, on the order of an hour. Because the reason I'm is hesitating is this is something we are doing right now. We are trying to optimize this. This I think we are achieving for one centimeter. We can do it in about on the order of one hour okay. for the delinquification process which is not too bad because if you think about the industry process, you can do this you know, in a batch uh, over the time and uh, cook the wood over the time and uh, uh, not too bad uh, if you can do that on, in terms of uh, uh, hour. Uh, hopefully we, we want to reduce this down to uh, uh, tens of minutes, um, but it, you know, it's a more of a reaction and diffusion, not much you can change about it. Yep. One yep. thing you can do is uh, to leverage the anisotropic structure of this and really you know, uh, make it thinner and uh, longer and uh, uh, to uh, improve the uh, process speed. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Professor Spapen, do you have other questions? Nope, nope, this is it. So, uh... Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so Dr. Yi Xiang Wang uh, have to go before 12. So uh, uh, we just invite him to ask questions first, uh, please. Uh, but you. please also uh, see our uh, uh, institution okay. and name. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Li, uh, for your great presentation. Uh, my name is Yixiang Wang, and uh, I'm an assistant professor in Department of Food Science at McGill University in Canada. Uh, so although I am in food science, but actually my background is polymer chemistry. So I also develop uh, natural polymer-based material, like uh, including cellulose and nanocellulose. So my students also work on a uh, straw, uh, also for fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But my question is uh, actually uh, about uh, nanocellulose. So as we know, uh, we have a lot of research works on nanocellulose and we say we can use them for different applications. But um, actually the industry like 
uh, in Montreal, we have a nanocellular industry. They are looking for um, uh, a most promising application for this nanocellular. So my question is, in your opinion, could you please comment on the most promising nanocellular in the future? Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's always hard to predict the future. So, but uh, for the same reason, I'll just uh, <laughs> share my thought anyway, because it won't be accurate. Uh, uh, only the time can tell us. Uh, I'm coming from the mechanics uh, and, and, and the plus material science. Uh, we ran into this material and uh, uh, all start from a piece of paper. Uh, but I think, I think that's the, the probably because we don't know much about this material and we try to uh, fit our knowledge and our needs uh, uh, into this material and try to see if this material can help us to solve the problem in our field. It turns out that uh, it works uh, well. And the way we, cause you know, the paper making industry has been a very, very long history and it's getting uh, to the, you know, the downslope. Uh, we visited a, a, a paper mill, which was closed last year. I think this is across the world that the paper making industry is declining because of the uh, reduction of the need, uh, decline of the need, and also this uh, awareness of the environmental impact. But I think uh, 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 if you think out of the box that, okay, the similar uh, technique or the expertise experience, the recipes that you accumulated over the years can be used for different other applications that are really can offer new opportunities. For example, making the paper uh, much stronger and tougher to de defeat the conflict between strength and the toughness. I think the structural material is one of the uh, uh, area I really have a uh, good hope for cellulose materials because uh, we have the wood and the bamboo and uh, uh, many uh, like fast growing grass, right? They have high uh, content in, uh, uh, in cellulose. And if you can come up with a solution or the procedure to process those materials into high performance structural materials, I think that's uh, the, the, uh, 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 the potential will be huge. Uh, maybe I'm naive on this, and uh, I know there is many challenges over there. And how do you compete with steel and with plastics? But I think uh, there are potentials there. Um, and, and this is uh, my rather random <laughs> guess of the future from a, uh, from a perspective of a mechanician working on cellulose. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for your video blog. I, I follow those uh, videos every day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your support. <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Saif, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. I don't know why I, why I cannot turn on my uh, video. It says I need an approval, but that's okay. I'm Tahir Saif from the University of Illinois. Tahir, Tahir, turn yes, it Tahir. off, turn it back on. Uh, Turn the zoom off and zoom on. No, no turn the no, no. video off and the turn the video back on. Uh, I did that a couple of times. Okay. It doesn't work. That's okay. Don't don't worry about it. Uh, uh, oh, it's not not working. Working. oh, it's okay. working now. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Good, good, good. Hey, great talk, Ten. Wonderful. Thank you, Tahir. Yes, yes. So I, I have a, maybe a question that. Uh, kind of contradicts the whole viewpoint, which is uh, the idea is the biodegradability. And I'm, I'm a great believer of the en environmental issues. So if we choose the wood type of materials for our products, uh, and if it is supposed to be biodegradable, which means you give it to the nature and nature gradually degrades it. But our home is also part of the nature and part of the biodegradation could be because oxygen is getting in, diffusion, inside the material, moisture getting in, uh, and then it begins to swell or something, right? Your, your images show beautifully. So if I have a product, uh, then I would expect them to degrade while I'm using it, while I'm at home, 
uh, it should gradually degrade, right? So in other words, it's sort of auto digesting itself because I want it to be biodegradable while I'm, uh, I just, you know, at the same time, I want to use it for a long enough time. So yeah, that's when, you, when you compress quite... the wood, right? When you make the wood very thin or the material that gets squeezed in, I would expect that there is an internal energy that would make it, that would want it to go back to some original state over long time kinetics, right? Uh, not 400 years, hopefully much earlier than that. Uh, so where is the line? So I want things to be biodegradable, but I want to use it enough, long enough time, so that it doesn't biodegrade itself at home, given the moisture and oxygen and all the other degrading contents in, in, in our environment, right? Yeah, that's actually a very uh, uh, good question. And I also deep, I thank you for uh, poking me on this. I think it, it, it has something to do, uh, first of all, has uh, it's, it's about the time frame we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So if you buy a product, and um, how many years are you gonna use this product mm -hmm. versus that how many years this material after I use it, it'll be biodegradable. Mm -hmm. So we are actually talking about the quite some uh, 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 different uh, time scale here. Many product we use uh, on a daily life, uh, we probably use that for a few days, a few months, sometimes a few years. And then we just uh, abandon those. And uh, oftentimes, hopefully they will be recycled or they will be able to degrade over many years, like 10 years, uh, 20 years. But oftentimes many of them will be just uh, getting into to a landfill and takes hundreds of years to degrade like the plastics. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's more of the striking the balance that, okay, can I have a product which can serve the purpose of its function? For example, I have a car I want to drive. I have some super wood replacing steel in it. Uh, we drive a car for a few years. And like sometimes we drive it for 10 years. After 10 years, this car is totaled. And then can you recycle the material from the car mm -hmm. to reuse, or can the, 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 the part that you cannot recycle dumped into the landfill, they will be degraded over next 10 years or 20 years. So when we talk about the, for example, the degree, two degree scenario, uh, it's over uh, the next 80 years. So I think we need to keep doing things that help us to stay within the budget of the carbon dioxide emission but that scale, length scale, a time scale is typically longer than the usage of the product we are using on a day to day. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think I, I get it. So it looks to me that what we want is while the product is being used at home or in, as a car, part of biodegradation does not change its shape. It is not going through some deformation process, however slow. So particularly advanced products would have high tolerance, right? High, mm -hmm. It has to satisfy high tolerance. Um, so we don't want them to gradually change the shape, even though that is small, uh, unlike steel or unlike plastic, which is, uh -huh. I think why plastic became so much our everyday thing is because once you make it, it is robust and doesn't uh -huh. change and you know doesn't deform. Uh, whereas something that is biodegradable something that you make one inch may be becoming 1.1 inch over a uh, half year, right? Okay. But biodegradation would be like next 10 years is completely degenerate itself. But can yeah, we but, afford to live with uh, this change of shape? My car is like, you know, this size, my suddenly uh -huh, uh -huh, it's uh -huh. even bigger. Yeah, yeah, okay. For that one, I think it's more, uh, 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 I can answer your question from more the uh, material science aspect of this. Mm -hmm. So, the, the way you densify this by 80% uh, mm -hmm. is enabled by partially removing the lignin. Mm -hmm. So basically you are not really densifying the wood itself. You are changing the composition of the, of the wood. This is actually one of the initial uh, uh, discussion when we were submitting the paper to Nature. Mm -hmm. The editor actually raised a very good point, very similar to what you asked, because, because the wood densification process is not new at all. Mm -hmm. People densify the wood all the time. Mm -hmm. But what people typically do is a physical approach. So for example, steam it, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you steam it, it becomes soft and start to densify it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it, it becomes uh, denser and stronger and uh, stiffer sometimes. But over a time when it absorbs the moisture, it starts to bounce back. Mm -hmm. I have one of the slides actually where I show the water stability of super wood. We actually compared that approach. Mm -hmm. You do see in this accelerated uh, environment, 98% uh, of a, a relative humidity for 128 hours, it does increase absorb energy mm -hmm. for this physically compressed densified wood. Mm -hmm. Now with this, our approach, you partially remove the ligandine, then you densify it. Then the, 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 the hydrogen bond among the cellulose uh, nanofibers can hold them together over long time. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a very harsh environment. So that we showed the 8.4%, that's uh, 98 uh, relative uh, humidity for, for almost a week. In reality, for example, uh, many houses built in this country is, is, is using wood, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the houses last for decades, sometimes 100 years, right? Those houses in Boston, I remember it's more than 100 years. You, you still can have all this wood serving its function. Mm -hmm. The way it works is you do maintenance, right? You have your AC to get the moisture and out, mm -hmm. keep the temperature in a certain range. Mm -hmm. So then the wood, the piece of wood block, in the in your house in, in your basement last much longer when this wood mm. in the natural environment so i think these two combined together mm. I, I, I think uh, and also you can have other ways to mitigate this environmental attack uh, i hope in the future the car you drive with the super wood you feel safe and <laughs> secure <laughs> without it growing in size yeah no, I, I think just my final point is if there is a way to switch on and off the biodegradability. So when I want to make the product by now biodegradable, is there anything that we can turn off? Mm -hmm. Then expedite the biodegradation while I'm using it. If there is a way to uh, turn off the biodegradability, maybe a coating, maybe something very simple, like you said, temperature control. That will be fantastic, yeah. right? Yeah, it's just like a, we, 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 we use the, the, this coating we, we bought from Home Depot, the coat, the, uh, the, the, the mm. super wood. And then in the accelerate test, it doesn't change at all. And, mm. and when you try to break this one, and this thin coating has almost no resistance to this mechanical fracture, try to break mm. the wood and mm. to recycle it. Yeah, so mm. I think that that's another uh, solution to this problem. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mrs. Kadoma. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ate. Um, I am going to be a first year PhD student at Harvard University with uh, Dr. Jigang Suo. Um, so I first wanted to say thank you for the great talk, Dr. Lee. It was very, uh, very exciting. Uh, my question was kind of taken by Dr. Saif. I was going to ask about the biodegradability of the superwood. Um, because um, as you emphasized in the beginning of your talk, um, recyclability um, and the end of life of your product is very important. Um, but what I was thinking is that um, the natural wood, as you showed in your um, SEM images, has uh, some gaps and some pits which allow moisture to enter the wood. And when you have that moisture, it allows um, uh, biological organisms to uh, also uh, degrade or like moisture and the organisms to degrade the wood. But when you um, uh, densify the wood, you remove those um, pits and you remove the, the defects, which is good for strengthening your material. But in terms of it being biodegradable, I wondered if that would um, shorten the time or how you plan to biodegrade the super wood. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, at, and uh, first of all, I, uh, thank you for tuning in. I, I see you are familiar with this and the name, <laughs> uh, frequent uh, uh, viewer of EMF webinar. Actually, I want to apologize. In one of them, I remember you had a question, but you waited very patient, but we ran out of time. You didn't get the chance to ask question. Uh, now, you <laughs> thank you for your question. Now, getting back to your question, uh, that's actually a very valid point. 
um, actually, uh, I talked to the uh, uh, the uh, expert uh, who did the uh, who have been doing this uh, biodegradability test in the United States. That actually, the, they they have this seal. Uh, if you want your product to be biocompostable, uh, you need to get the uh, certification. And there are only several labs around the nation can do that. I talked to them. They have a very standard uh, uh, test uh, to test the biodegradability. Uh, if you follow the procedure, the protocol to do the test, then uh, if you densify the wood, uh, definitely I would argue, we haven't tested that yet. Um, uh, it will increase the time for the same material. So for example, if you want to compare a natural, uh, a piece of natural wood versus a, a, a super wood, the biodegradable, biodegradable test um, will give you the result that, okay, uh, probably the natural wood is more degradable or it takes a shorter time than the super wood uh, to degrade. But a similar argument, if you break down the, a piece of natural wood into fibers, make paper pulp and make a piece of paper, that piece of paper takes a much shorter time to degrade, right? You can put it in your backyard, it, it can be compostable in uh, a, a few weeks, right? Uh, but if you have a piece of wood in your backyard, it takes months, years, right, uh, 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 to degrade the break into uh, pieces. I think that's actually very natural, but I think the process we're doing is not really changing the nature of wood. It's just that we're not adding things in it. We're actually extract things from it and densify it. So the material itself is still a biomaterial. Naturally, it's still biodegradable. It's just a matter of how long it takes. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Keep coming. <laughs> Thank you. Know, I will. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> hello, Tan, and hello, everyone. Hey, Nigel. Yeah, so um, now Tan has many fans um, for your vlog. And I think today you gave them a very wonderful example uh, to your fans how to implement the tips and the principles you are sharing with them from choosing the research topic to how to give a good presentation. So we also learned a lot. And um, my question is uh, regarding the uh, densification process. So you mentioned that during this process, a lot of magics happen, including like forming more hydrogen bonds and also forming those uh, uh, hand by hand um, locking structures. So um, I'm wondering whether those mechanisms uh, happen at uh, different levels of densification and whether there's a threshold that for the densification for those mechanisms to happen. And um, also, uh, are you worried about uh, like over compressing um, to crush the material? So this is the secret uh, source uh, for this uh, uh, material processing process. So we, I, I just want to know more details. Thank you, Nanshu, for your comment and for your question. Actually, you're right. Actually, I'm, I'm giving myself extra pressure. <laughs> I was offering tips for other people how to give presentation. Now you need to give a presentation. And it's, it's very easy for you to give tips to other people. But <laughs> when it comes to that, you are, you are the person doing the presentation. Yeah, uh, but I think that's a, a good pressure. Um, hopefully, I, uh, at least I can offer some lessons <laughs> for, for my viewers. Back to your question. Um, uh, yeah, you're right. I, I, I think these, uh, so let me give you the, uh, the uh, limiting case, okay? Now, if you crash this so hard uh, without the limit, eventually you are doing a compression strength test of the material, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, that's how actually we, we measure the compression uh, strength of the, of the super wood, uh, which I didn't show in the backup slide. Uh, yes, in the uh, 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 second step of densification, definitely, uh, uh, you need to uh, strike the balance between removing the water, uh, densify the, uh, the wood structure, and the maintaining the 
uh, uh, integrity of the of, of the whole structure. Um, it, it 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 it's a subtle process. Uh, takes time and uh, experience uh, to to master. And the, and you are asking a hard question, but uh, I agree with you. It it, it matters. Right? Uh, Professor Ray Huang. Hey, Ray. Okay, hi. <laughs> very, very <laughs> nice, very exciting talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but uh, I guess I'll start with a simple one. For the super wood, uh, you do a lot of compression and you reduce the volume by like a factor of nine or so, right? Five. Does that also change the density? Okay. How much? Uh, we yeah, we, we, we densified it by a factor of five. So 80% uh, okay. of thickness are gone. So you 20% uh, left. You increase the density from um, typical wood, you know, the wood actually can flow in, in uh, float mm -hmm. in the water. That's how right. they transport the wood logs. At around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, sometimes 0 0.9, mm -hmm. depending on the species. After we densify it, the density is around 1.3, 1.2, Point four, also depending on the species. It so leads to a, two. Yeah, okay. a factor, yeah, less than two, I would argue. Okay. But again, it's still, it's comparable uh, with uh, to many plastics that we're using, PET, mm -hmm. PC, uh, still very lightweighted um, than many metals. Very good. So that means you removed quite a bit of these other ingredients that takes away uh, maybe some water to, I don't know, uh, okay, squeezing out. Okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, essentially, you remove mo most of the thing you removed is the gap, the defect. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other question is more uh, about the two mechanisms you talked about uh, in the first part. So the one is, is removing the defects. The other one is built through this uh, hydrogen bond sliding and reforming. Uh, so both of mechanisms looks like uh, are concerning for single fiber. So it works within single fiber. Now we are, with your paper is a network of fibers. Uh, the, these fibers are kind of uh, spaghetti together. Uh, what are the interactions between fibers or does that matter in terms of strength and toughness? Oh, that actually matters a lot. Um, indeed, this uh, sliding, uh, also some slide I didn't uh, show today. Uh, so if you think about the random network, right? So mm -hmm. the the uh, the two limiting cases is one that they are parallel to each other, right? The, the, this is mm -hmm. the ideal case you want. And okay. the, the another limit is they are perpendicular. So the, instead right. of a line contact, uh, you do point contact. Mm -hmm. We actually looked into these two limiting cases. You do this and you do this. Mm -hmm. uh, we found that actually the uh, this uh, hydrogen bond uh, occurs at both cases, really depending on how large is your building block size. So we compare it. So remember, I, I showed the control experiment of the using the carbon nanotube as mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, let me take this up here. So uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm charge this. Um, so for the carbon nanotube, the reason uh, uh, it, it's weak is because although individual uh, carbon nanotube bundle are very strong, but when you are stretching, fracturing a piece of a carbon nanotube film, it's the relative sliding among them, mm -hmm. which is essentially Van der Waals. Because if you don't do any treatment, it's just the Van der Waals interactions, which is a rather weak. Uh, uh, so that's why this carbon nanotube film or paper is very weak uh, and also brittle as well. Now, with this uh, cellulose, we actually show that even if you are doing this perpendicular sliding, the hydrogen bond is strong enough. It actually causes the, it's like a, the deforming of the fiber. If you do something like this, it's like a bow and arrow shape. Mm -hmm. So there are strong interactions over there. We actually verified this uh, through a few other uh, experiments. So for example, certain wood fibers are hollow. It's like tubes, okay? Instead of breaking down the tubes into very fine fibers, uh, we have some chemistry to really unzip the tube. So when you unzip the tube, the zip, the tube becomes a ribbon. The ribbon mm -hmm. is actually uh, a, a micrometer in length and in width.
but it's very thin in nanometer thickness. Uh, so it's very thin uh, uh, rib ribbons. You use these ribbons to make a piece of paper. And this piece of paper is also very strong and very tough. It's because, simply because when you open up the tubes into ribbons, when they laminate each other, there are a lot of interactions among them. So you form a lot of bond. And uh, that's actually uh, an easier way uh, to achieve both high strength and toughness. I see. So basically you're saying this hydrogen bonding mechanism not only works at molecular chain level, but also in the fiber or ribbon level, yeah. sort of a yes. nano scale, the micro scale. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's more of the surface effect, right? It's right. just that we know right. that right. when you right. keep increasing right. the, the building block, you are exposing more surface areas. Right. So you are right. making That's... more hydrogen bond in effect. Uh, mm -hmm. And also in the limited case that if you align the fibers, we actually did this. So in a different type of uh, cellulose, it's, it's, it's a cellulose uh, uh, made by the bacteria. So you, if you well align the fibers, you can actually really benefit, maximize this uh, effect. Then you can achieve a tensile strength uh, approaching one gigapascal. Yeah. So in that case, the strength really driven by this bonding, not the defect of individual fiber? It's still the defects. So you really, uh, so the two things, the alignment uh, will actually help you to benefit more of this uh, 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 secondary bonding strategy to give you high energy dissipation when you mm -hmm. fracture it. And, but the strength also uh, matter the most uh, if how much or how large is the defect in it. You really want to, so in, in that case, the, the, those fibers are re relatively longer than the wood fibers than, and the bacteria made cellulose uh, fibers. So mm -hmm. that also help reduce the defect in the material. And that's actually another major reason for the high strength. Mm -hmm. Essentially, I, I, I'm, I'm, and the, the point I wanna make is the, the, the fundamental basic mechanics still works. Like this sure. very simple one formula can fit very well the scaling law over three order magnitude of, of, of length uh, of the fiber diameter. That, that's actually my question. I don't see the connection between that scaling law with the hydrogen bonding mechanism. Oh, Not that part. Is, okay, so that curve is actually basically is a, it, indeed it was Zheng who did the the model. <laughs> it, it's more a fracturing mechanical model that if right, you have right. a surface crack on the right. on the fiber, what will be the energy release rate and uh, and you compare uh, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but but it, essentially the smaller the defect, higher the strength, uh, somewhat the whole patch effect. Thank you. Can I speak up? Yeah. Can I uh, switch topics just a little bit? So this is Dan Cosgrove at Penn State University and um, you know, plant biologists have been very successful at altering lignin in woody materials, poplar in, in particular. And I wonder if you've, you've considered the possibilities for using some of these transgenic woody materials as a, in, in conjunction with de densification um, for uh, either making, improving densification or making it uh, a faster process or cheaper process you know, thoughts along those lines. Have, uh, have, have you considered those possibilities? Yeah, wonderful point. And actually, I, I really want, uh, hope that this video later on can be viewed by more of this uh, uh, plant scientists working on the genetic editing of this. Um, I have this dream that, okay, uh, that if you can do the gen genetic editing of the wood and you can grow the wood with the desirable composition you want. And then that will essentially eliminate our first step. You just do the second step. You cut the tree, press it, you get a piece of super wood. Yeah. And the, currently the genetic editing engineering of uh, uh, plant science, as you mentioned, uh, for popular, very uh, uh, popular uh, model material people work on. Um, and uh, it, it, the main purpose is so far, if I understand it correctly, is more for the uh, optimization of the biofuel uh, conversion rate, right? 
uh, it's not really uh, looking into much of the uh, mechanical property of the material. So again, this is uh, another uh, uh, example as some other people asked previously. There is opportunity over there. So uh, it's uh, the, the genetic editing, uh, the plant scientists, they can do it, uh, but they may not be aware of this opportunity that by optimizing or editing the, the genes of the plant, you can achieve something uh, more than just biofuel uh, uh, conversion uh, ratio uh, optimization. Yeah, thank you for raising that 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 uh, that point. Yeah. Okay, uh, Rubin, and next one will be Jingda. Mm -hmm. Hello, Tong. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Robin Bai. I previously worked with Trigong uh, for my PhD. I'm currently a postdoc with Kaushik Bhattacharya at Caltech. So um, I, my general question is, uh, first came to my mind, how about a cellulose hydrogel? Then let me um, maybe elaborate a little bit about the thought process. So when I was Listening to your talk about the nanofiber cellulose, then I, I just Googled about the cellulose-based hydrogel. There's uh, quite some papers about that, but I knew none of them. Uh, and um, I'm kind of confident we, are, we, we know most of the paper about toughness and strength of hydrogels in this field. So then, then, I, then that, that came to my mind about this magic material PVA polyvinyl alcohol, which has a OH group, hydroxide group in each of its monomers. So they form these densely packed hydrogen bonds. Then when you synthesize this material, the interesting part is at room temperature is not soluble, but you increase, you mix it with water, you increase the temperature to hundred degrees C and they, then it's soluble. So there is some kinetic energy barrier between them. And then now you reduce the temperature to room temperature, it's almost soluble forever. So at the most uh, concentration. So it's kind of stable. And then you make a hydrogel, then you heat it up, then you anneal, you get the toughest, one of the toughest and the strongest hydrogel you can ever imagine. Of course, the water content may sacrifice a little bit. So my question is, how about the, a similar process or am I, comparing apple to apple here, and more about the fundamental mechanism about this water and the cellulose. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Robin. And Robin will be joining Northeastern University as a junior faculty uh, pretty soon, and uh, good luck to that. And um, um, yeah, that uh, question on the effect of water uh, on the uh, structural stability mechanical property uh, of cellulose material, it's a wide open problem, to be honest. Um, I ask uh, my student and postdocs uh, uh, quite often this, this question, and we also look into literatures. It's not something uh, well understood. I can give you some very simple uh, 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 phenomena you see on the daily life, like a piece of paper, right? So. When you soak the uh, the water, uh, soak the paper in water, or you just draw, have the drop of uh, uh, water onto the paper, and it'll somewhat help uh, disintegrate the, the 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 fibers in 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 the in in the, in, in the paper, and the paper becomes uh, much weaker than the uh, the regular paper. Uh, however, if you uh, in our experiment, um, it turns out that sometimes you do need a certain amount of moisture in the process to help the formation of the initial hydrogen bond to have a better mechanical performance. So how to uh, strike the balance between these two limit is actually not well understood. So what is the optimal amount of water to uh, achieve the uh, best mechanical property uh, I don't have an answer, and I really doubt that there is an answer to that. And that's also another open project people can work on, and you probably can work on it as well. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I have Thanks, a I'm... bit of information on this. Recently, I, uh, Robin, you probably forgot, there was also in your one of your old papers, 
that we did topological adhesion. We one of the polymer we used was cytomates. Recently, we published yet another paper. I just made a connection because Robin <laughs> asked this question. So what we uh, did was the following. The cellulose is known to dissolve uh, when pH is dissolving in water, when pH is uh, maybe above 13. So then we just dissolve it, cellulose polymer. Then we spread this uh, polymer on two pieces of uh, soft material. When the material cellulose sees a regular pH, it will form network. And that work, network topologically entangled with the two pieces of material. It's a really strong um, uh, adhesive for, and it's a pH trigger. So uh, it was also in, we devote one paper recently just on this. And in particular, we show it's a quite remarkable that adhesive is extraordinarily fast, can be fast because uh, the topological entanglement only need to entangle one unit cell, polymer cell. So cellulose gel is used as adhesive. Don't say that ever again that it has never been used, never even measured, toughness is very high. No problem. <laughs> no, I'm, I agree with that, but then, but then okay, you, you mentioned about superficial, right? You have a single layer. Yeah. But then the experience was, when, when we were doing that topological adhesion paper was also, it's very hard for it to diffuse in deeper. Yeah, that right. was a well, mistake you made <laughs> in your paper. Recently, we corrected that mis misconception. Yeah, that, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, in topological adhesion, it's called topological adhesion one. Your paper was zero. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I think a dance lab uh, has developed all kinds of uh, uh, technologies to dehydrate the, 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 the cellulose, to control the, wa uh, the water content in the, in the cellulose fibers. Uh, yeah, uh, we are actually working on that. Uh, how would we control the, the, the compositions uh, around the uh, cellulose fibers to uh, gain the mechanical properties? So, <laughs> so we're working, uh, uh, currently working on that. Perfect. I have actually have a question for both uh, um, Turn and also for our biologist, Daniel. Here, here's a question, or uh, before, so Turn, in the beginning of your talk, you showed us a short clip of a famous movie. The word was plastics, right? But that is a word for 1960s. So today you showed us a new word. That word is cellulose. So my question is uh, beyond cellulose, there must be other uh, naturally abundant uh, biopolymers that can be converted to other things. One thing uh, coming to my mind, people already explored that was a silk. My question to both of you, but what are other naturally abundant polymers that uh, you know mechanics people material science people can begin to de uh, develop that is then you want to take the challenge because I, I think <laughs> you probably are better suited than me <laughs> to answer this question <laughs> well well chitin comes to mind so yeah. that, that's the material that's uh, Analogous to cellulose in some ways, but has but has different chemical and different uh, structural organization. Uh, Wait a minute, professor. Please spell that the word. I'm taking note for my graduate student. Chitin. It's C H I T I N. Oh, chitin. Yeah, I think chitin. Yeah. We, we use that. Yeah, thank you. We use that. Yeah. Yeah. It's from crabs, right? Yeah. If I could bring up a, a general category, um, I mean, the uh, cellulose is, is one of the polysaccharides, right? So you could yeah. look at the polysaccharides as a family. Yeah. And uh, I remember years ago, uh, there was a very clever fellow at NIH who was working on this. I've forgotten his name. His first name was Victor. And then his, his last name was Armenian. I forget who it is. Maybe some of you know him. 
but he did some very nice work on, on the, the on polymeric work on, on polysaccharides and many of its properties. So maybe it'd be a good idea to look at the polysaccharides more generally than just, just the cellulose and see what, uh, what you can. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Yeah. Atta, are you taking notes? Okay, good. Uh, I'm taking notes too. <laughs> well, I'm worried that I need to find a new topic for Atta. <laughs> she has a high expectation. We try very hard to recruit her for Harvard. <laughs> she has been proactive. I, I saw her quite a few times, uh, probably uh, all the time. Uh, and, Turn the, yeah. I, I also have another question, serious question. Um, maybe also for Etta as well. Now, you know, for ages, people have a chop up work uh, for making paper or making, uh, or just uh, wood dust during the wood processing and then reconstitute that wood into something else useful. Now, just, uh, uh, Franz just asked you a question, a kinetic question about how, how long you need to densify all that. Uh, of course, if you chop up wood into small pieces, then all this uh, process, kinetic process will be fast. Have you guys uh, considered this uh, middle step, just chop it up or just uh, collect pieces of wood, people, wood dust. People make yeah, during uh, regular wood processing and then do your magic, making hard wood and then reconstitute it at, uh, does this, is this a viable, is this a viable thing to it do? It is, it is. Actually when it, the straw mm. uh, is an, an example uh, mm. to answer your question. Yeah. For the straw, the microfibers are made from the bio waste. It's just that the the baguettes, the uh, yeah, yeah. after you extract the sugar from a sugar can, this what's left is yeah. called the baguettes. It has actually high in uh, 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 in in cellulose, and uh, you just um, remove some lignin out of that, and uh, you can make uh, uh, strong and uh, uh, you know straws, and uh, which is also. Uh, water stability is uh, reasonable. That's just one example. Uh, you can use um, many other uh, bio waste or some very low value biomass, as long as they have uh, 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 they are rich in cellulose, and you can do the uh, process. And uh, there are uh, uh, like bamboo; they are growing very fast. They are also the fast growing wood. Uh, in, in one slide, I showed that, that this uh, process is actually universal for different uh, species of wood, hardwood, softwood, um, because you are really touching to the fundamental building blocks of different wood. Different wood species, the major difference is how large are the pores, how large are the pits, uh, how dense they are, and, uh, and uh, some other, like the, uh, I, I don't quite remember the, the name of the grass, they grow very fast, Dan probably know that. Um, those has a very low cost and they, by doing something, converting this into a high value product, I think that's something of both uh, scientific uh, uh, interest and also uh, uh, um, um, economic value there. Yeah. And not to mention the environmental impact. So uh, I have a question that you'll you'll think ridiculous, but I'll put it out there anyways. Uh, you know, Arabidopsis is the, the model system for plant genetics, Arabidopsis, and it makes a stem. It's not really wood, but it's it's as close to wood as what grasses use. It's small, but it, so it's, it's maybe um, uh, two or three or four millimeters in diameter. And so, uh, but it has the advantage of, of very quickly being able to manipulate the genes and alter uh, the quality of the cell walls. So my question is, is it practical to apply your densification technique with something that's, that's like a, a thin, a, thin uh, a pencil, uh, but much thinner than a pencil and, and uh, evaluate uh, the, the material properties of that? Oh yeah, it's it's very readily available. So you, you, this intensification process, basically you, you press them. And sometimes you add some uh, temperature over there to uh, increase the 
uh, speed uh, uh, acceler acceleration. And it, it, so the thinnest one we were making is, if you think about the piece of paper, you were talking about the tens of microns, uh, you can readily make those. And for this uh, material, this plant you are uh, mentioning, I, I think it's uh, very suitable for the press, uh, the densification process. And, it, and if it's thin, it probably helps your kinetics, right? And, and... Exactly, exactly. So what's the name of that uh, material you're talking about then? Can you share, uh, <laughs> can you spell that for us? I'll, I'll spell it on the chat. How is that? Oh, terrific. That's, that's well, even better. I'm taking English notes. Uh, what, what's the English name? Well, it's called Arabidopsis. Sorry, sorry about that. No, no, I, I, I've heard. That it's a Ara Ara Arabidopsis. I mean, people have a common name for it. I, I just put it in the, in the chat yeah. to everyone. Okay, that's uh, fine. So, have you always struggling uh, in uh, working with the back cabinets uh, about these terminologies? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Franz, I actually have a question yeah. for you. You are the teacher of uh, all of us, teachers, teacher. So now today, um, yeah, uh, uh, Turn showed us uh, this uh, a weak bond, hydrogen bond, and a strong chain, this yeah. kind of uh, architecture clearly give uh, good properties, that's natural. But in your extensive experience of uh, you know engineering material, metals, ceramics, or uh, there must be good examples of this. Come to my mind, it's just a ceramic matrix composite. It's also kind of like that. So in metals, do, do people do this kind of thing? You, you mean in, in pure metals and alloys or in composite? Yeah, alloys, uh, do people take advantage of this, uh, you know, layered structure or fibrous structure, but with a you know, kind of weak interface. Um, <clears throat> well, th 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 that gets you immediately in in into composites. If you look at mm -hmm. bulk three-dimensional materials, well, obviously, you know, uh, in some ways, you know, a dislocation is, is, is something yeah. that breaks a bond and remakes it, right? So that's, yeah. a, that's a trivial example, and, and that would be in bulk. But, but the sort of stuff that the thing was talking about, there I would look uh, at, um, at composite materials and, and the way the interfaces are treated in, uh, in the way that is if you were to um, you know, break a bond when it slides out, does it cannot be remade, right? And this gets us back to some of the work that people are doing. I mentioned the self-healing material, materials. And so in, in that literature, you'll find some stuff where, where people have, have thought about, about such things and uh, where you where you you know have supplies of materials that will come back and remake things and so the uh, so I would really look to to composites if you're looking for materials that yeah. mimic what what we just heard and, yeah yeah I see Jawi's face Jawi can you turn your video or turn your uh, turn uh, on mute yeah. Jawi was a former student now a uh, a a postdoc at uh, at MIT. He was a person who discovered uh, cellulars as a material for mm -hmm. topological adhesion. Do, do you have a few few words to say about cellulars? The word of the day, cellulars. Yeah. Um, yeah. At that time, when we work on the topological adhesion, uh, we're just looking for material that can um, trigger it to change its um, you know, its structure, for example, you from solution state to solid state so that we can um, create a polymer network that topologically entangled with two another uh, polymer networks. So in my mind, we are working on pH triggering. So I just are searching all the polymers that are, can be pH triggered. So cellular is just one of the candidates. So when I dig into liter uh, literature that the PK is about 13. So and it's relatively cheap. We can directly buy from, you know, Sigma, then, then we can process it very easily. So that doesn't require us to do more detailed chemical uh, synthesis or processing. So it's very straightforward to use it. Yeah, we do. Uh, what's, the, what's the diameter and the length of the cellulose you were using? This is just polymer. Um, okay. Molecular weight is about hundreds uh, um, hundred kilo Dalton. 
It's not a fuel. Are you, are you are talking about the deep value? Say that again? Are talking about the degree of a polymerization? Uh, yes. Okay. So, Zhao, you please send your paper to Chen Li. Oh, I will be- He is the world authority on cellulars. He didn't know your work. Unbelievable. Okay. Yeah, I do. I do. So the real expert is Dan. <laughs> I'm still learning from people like him. Yeah. So, so, so I, I, I've been working with Dan on this project, Cellulose, also. They started Cellulose, right? For mm -hmm. nearly one half years with the postdoc working together with, with, with Dan. So, for primary cell wall, this uh, cellulose fibers are almost aligned. The majority of the uh, cellulose fibers are aligned, they're not tangled. But there are small fraction of 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 uh, of cellulose fibers that are kind of uh, cross bonded, right? Uh, not not aligned, cross bonded, and that part of the that fraction of the cellulose fibers play a tremendous role in strengthening the the, the lamina. That's what we found. Uh, we are we are actively writing a a, a particle uh, no, a paper on that. Uh, if, do you have any uh, comments on that? Um, I'd say the, the modeling of, of this has been for me very insightful. I'm a biologist and so uh, being able to model something with fairly simple principles and then uh, pull out of that a lot of the behavior that plant biologists have seen for a long time but never had a mechanistic understanding of, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's been quite, uh, quite a surprise and I, I think uh, it's a, it's a, you know, using material science and modeling approaches to understand uh, plant biology questions, plant cell wall biology questions is, uh, is something that's, that uh, has, has a big future. So I would uh, encourage all of you to, to think about uh, trying to find some plant cell wall people to talk with in your local area. Yeah. Hey, Dan, and thank you very much for sharing. A question about yeah, a Google question, your comment suggestion uh, before. So you suggested that um, because you can modify genetically something. Um, and uh, so of course in the past people modify genes for all kinds of reasons. For example, make food taste better. Now suppose I want to make this thing happen to have a better mechanical properties or simpler synthesis. Do you have any example people like material science uh, uh, can latch on this idea. It's a, every campus has a biologist, right? Once we have a, one example we can explain to our biologist friend, then collaboration become possible. Do you have a prior examples of this kind? Modified genes for processing of materials, for mechanical properties, or for whatever can, Interface well, with the material scientists. Well, well. So what's what's closest to to what we've been talking about is is uh, the the changing uh, lignin structure in plants using mm -hmm. genetic techniques. Yeah. And and the plant geneticists and lignin chemists have worked together to modify lignin, and then they've done a little bit of of material science on it. It's been uh -huh. very very limited, very primitive, I think, at this point. And, and I don't think people have, have considered uh, taking it further. For example, examining the processing abilities of, of uh, uh, as in super densification. Yeah. Uh, but but the, lignin, the lignin story is one that plant biologists, at least plant cell wall biologists will, will definitely be able to relate to. Um, what, what's true is, is that there's a, a big divide between material scientists and, and plant biologists, yeah. right? And, and there's not many uh, connection points between them. Uh -huh. And so that's something that's, that's got to be, you know, you've, you've got to make those connections one by one. That's an opportunity, right? Yeah. I would pose that as something that it's an open field. There's a big gap there, but it's an open field for exploration. And uh, if you can find a... a um, uh, a, a, a somebody in the plant field, the plant cell wall field, that is, that, that can hear how you're 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 thinking and how you're talking about it, yeah. and then contribute some of their ideas. Then then I think there's a, a big potential for 
publications, research, and so on. Thank you. Yeah, some years ago, we did spend a lot of time with a local plant biologist. You probably know her, Missy Holbrook. Yeah. Yeah. We talked a lot when we started to do hydrogel, and he noticed, she noticed uh, us uh, doing that. We actually spent a lot of time, but we didn't manage to yeah. closure. I understand. So, so our center, this DOE center we have, it's it's the intention is to is to have it a mixture of biologists and physicists. Wonderful. So uh, there's a little bit of material science, not very much. It's more basic, fundamental physical principles, uh, uh, um, and it's taken a long time to make those interactions. When we first started, you know, we had different vocabulary, different perspectives on things, different context, and uh, and gradually it's happened, you know. So, so uh, Sulin mentioned this this modeling of the of the cell wall. Uh, I've been trying to find people to to help me do this, and this is the third time. And this is finally it's actually, you know, gotten traction and it's actually working and it's a joy to see. But you have to be persistent, you know. You try once, it doesn't really get traction, then you you can't give up. You got to keep trying, and eventually with luck, <laughs> and if you live long enough, uh, you'll get traction, and then you'll be able to see it uh, make a be, make advances in the field. So that, that's We're where we are. We're a joint paper between you and Su Ling. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes. Su Ling, first time, just send me the paper when the paper is ready. Sure, sure, sure. We're talking very fast. <laughs> Yeah, but okay. then, then I, I, when, whenever you're ready, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. And I think uh, 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 Sulin and Dan, I really thank you. Uh, I think you are bringing a new mode for YML webinar. Um, so in, in in one of the vlog I I posted recently, I was sharing a, a tip. Uh, Sigurd Wagner uh, taught me uh, to prepare for the presentation is to invite a friend outside of your field and to ask questions and then, then he call it a torture process. Uh, but today, and uh, Su Lin brought Dan in and uh, I really enjoy it. I don't feel it's a torture at all. It's a, uh, hopefully then you find that the time, the several hours you spend with us also uh, valuable as well. I enjoyed a lot with the interactions with everyone, including particularly today, uh, all of my expectation, expectation that uh, you are here and a few other people in the, uh, feel the different from mechanics. I think uh, I, I would uh, encourage other people in the future. It's really hard to bring the people outside your field to talks like this, but if you are collaborating with each other, I mean, this is actually a, a, a good mode uh, to uh, foster the collaborations. And um, I'm quite sure that we are all taking notes and uh, <laughs> from Dan and, and uh, this is great. This is great. And actually, your last name looks very familiar to me. Because at one point, we were talking to Missy Holbrook. I spent a large amount of time reading papers. I was so excited. The thing we're interested in Xylem. Your name um, looks familiar. So, so that, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that is very uh, influential, influential figure in the uh, plant, uh, plant cell uh, biology, uh, bi bi biology uh, field. And I'm very lucky that at the same time is very open uh, in collaboration with different people, different, different fields. Yeah. So uh, uh, I give a talk in, in, in inside Penn State and uh, then I went there and listened to my talk and immediately we, we we start to chat and, and we yeah. immediately we, we say, okay, let's uh, let's go for collaboration collaboration yeah. and we hired a postdoc together. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And and I, I do believe the field of mechanics has a lot to offer uh, to our understanding of the structure of plant cell walls. This is this is how we're approaching it. Uh, and and the plant cell wall community, um, you know, they they have not um, uh, really tapped into the potential of mechanics giving giving insights into the structure of the cell wall. So that's you know what this collaboration between Sulin and me. That's uh, that's partly what we're trying to develop. Terrific, terrific. 
Okay, so Jingda, do you still want to ask questions? Yes, yes. Hi, Jingda. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Professor Tan. So, uh, I'm Jingda Tan from Xi'an Jiazhong University. So, uh, my question is that, so people use wood to build the architectures for thousand years. So like uh, in ancient China, but most of them are burnt away. So now you have super wood. Uh, have you ever uh, evaluated the fire retarding property of this, this material? The second question is a general question. So now you have a very, very good material. So will this material open new opportunities for wood? Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think your second question is relatively easy to answer. The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, the first question <clears throat> uh, is also yes. Uh, we, we did the fire retirement test. Uh, what, indeed, in our college, we have one of the only handful uh, fire protection department in our college. Um, we have colleagues working uh, there and they have the standardized the test and uh, 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 in short the super wood or densified wood has a better uh, uh, fire retardance than natural wood and there is also one interesting aspect that I learned in this process. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's some. Okay. So, uh, if you think about this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, fire retardance uh, issue, but if, if the if you look around at the houses uh, in the United States, many of them are built. Uh, uh, wood, okay? So, uh, it's actually in the uh, fire code of buildings. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's actually that the material is flammable or not is more of that if this material can catch the fire, do you give enough time for the people inside the house to escape? So, which means that if you think about the, if you go to the campfire, the wood log can burn for a long, long time. And if you uh, uh, put off the, the, the fire in the middle and the core side, which is not burned, still maintain its structural rigidity. So, which means that when, in case of a house is catching fire, it takes quite some time for people to escape. As long as people can escape, this material in terms of fire code is, is okay because lives are valuable, but houses you can rebuild. So uh, in that sense, uh, I think it's an interesting aspect I learned, but to your question, yes, it, it is better in terms of fire retardness. Yeah, but if you if you want to build a, a architecture, a wood architecture, a certain for long time, uh, for example, for thousand years, can you do this uh, for your uh, super wood? If if I say yes, I need to be live long enough. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Uh, um, yeah, you you know the uh, uh, last year, what was that? This fire in. In, in Paris, uh, uh, this uh, yes. famous, uh, architecture burned uh, sadly. And um, yeah, um, I wish, of course, I would like to see more buildings uh, made of uh, wood and the super wood. There are actually new initiatives around the world uh, to, to revisit using the wood material as the building block for uh, architectures, even uh, also with this high rise buildings. Um, uh, yeah, uh, well, we need to live longer to see that. <laughs> Actually, Tang, I remember seeing a picture where um, for, for a hall where some of the wood structures still stood and the steel in there had gotten soft and was actually had bent. So steel, of course, loses its strength very quickly when you go to higher temperatures. And so, so in that sense, uh, wood has certain advantages over when it comes to fire safety. When, when exactly. So now, if you look back to the tragic event of Twin Tower, yeah, well, that that's why that that's uh, the people did the analysis. The the reason is essentially because the burning the high temperature softened the, the steel and the collapse yeah. of the whole building. Yeah. So in that sense, as exactly the point you, you made, yeah. Right, and, and, and wood, because of the, the, the carbon formation slows down 
the, uh, the the reaction, and so you have, as you say, you have a much longer time um, to get out, or for help to get there and then put out the fire, right? So the, yeah. So, France, you always amaze me. Your last comment actually captured what we found in the uh, uh, burning test. It's it's the surface that formed this char layer to slow down right. the burning process. <laughs> but the, yeah. the, the people that you're Fire safety <laughs> know this very well, I'm sure. But a question yeah, about yeah, this, yeah. This but, question about your graphite in this. Where do you get it? Does you get it from wood also? Is it charred wood or is it how, how do you oh, get the graphite? The, the, the graphite? the graphite is just we buy from the commercial grade. Yeah, graphite. but how do they get it? Is it is it mineral or is it also organically derived? Oh, it's just the 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 the, the high quality flakes. Uh, I don't think they have. I, I think it's. Um, because it's a commercial product, they don't tell you much of the details over there, uh, how they make it. But uh, it's just a the, the reason is they because it's an industry project that they wanted to go cheap, cheap, cheap. So <laughs> so yep. as long as you can from get the viable uh, a source of material, uh, uh, the better. So um, hmm. just the, the typical graphite you can buy on the market. Yeah, flakes. I know, but I was just curious because, in principle, that can also be wood derived, right? If you, uh, oh, you're right, you're right. So, uh, okay, you're right. When you when you uh, increase the temperature and high enough, uh, you cause the uh, carbonization of the cellulose into yeah, um, either amorphous carbon or if you light a patch, this is what you get, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I'm Chang Yun. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Chang Yun Sao uh, from uh, Michigan State. So uh, I'm a pro assistant professor here. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I missed uh, your first part uh, due to time conflict. Uh, I will uh, see the videos later. Uh, but I have a question uh, and for the setters. You today, you, uh, many people, it's a setters day, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, we uh, also, uh, because I'm working on some, also working on some packaging uh, related, you know, packaging materials. So actually for the cellulose, nano cellulose, uh, many guys uh, in this field, they are using that. Uh, when we, uh, uh, you know, use that, some people will see, uh, the, uh, because I'm working on some uh, cellulose based uh, nano materials for this. And, uh, uh, Compared to other, you know, matrix materials or the the, the uh, components, you know, the cellulose, nano nanocellular uh, uh, crystals actually is a uh, high cost. So it's uh, it, some people consider, uh, you know, for the plastic bags, if you want to replace them, is the cost of prohibitive, you know. So uh, I don't know how much uh, uh, the the materials you uh, use in your experiment. So how, how you to solve this problem and uh, to reduce the cost? Yeah, uh, thank you, Changyun, uh, uh, for this question. I think the the cellulose you were referring to are CNCs, the cellulose nanocrystal. Those yeah. are the crystal crystalline phase in the cellulose chain, and uh, the uh, manufacturing of CNC it is expensive. And of course, the property of that is good, but uh, essentially it's, uh, it's high strength, uh, but it's rather brittle material uh, and also very expensive. Uh, the point I wanna make here is, so the cellulose existing, uh, existing in uh, many biomass and you can start from the very low cost of biomass and do certain process to get the material with desirable properties uh, for a certain purpose without the need to go all the way to remove the amorphous phase to get the uh, 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 cellulose uh, nanocrystal. So uh, in that case, you can address this issue of cost. Uh, uh, CNC in terms of uh, material science research and also other applications as you mentioned, uh, is of great interest, uh, but probably, and it's already used in uh, other pharmaceuticals and uh, maybe in food industry as well. But I think this low cost 
uh, 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 large uh, volume uh, biomass uh, uh, treatment to uh, benefit from the property of cellulose could be having a bigger potential. Yes. That's my take of this. Yeah, thank you. Jia Wei. Uh, hi, Peraton. Um, thank you so much. I really enjoy the talk. So I have two questions. So first of all, now you have this super wood and you are uh, going to put it into, into uh, practical applications like architecture, automobile, or airplane. So in those applications, you must need to integrate your, um, or your hybrid your wood with other materials like plastics, elastomers. How do you envision there will be a, uh, how do your uh, wood to be coupled with other materials? To the first question. The second one is, um, so far, are you aware of any weakness of your super wood? For example, you only mentioned so strong, so tough, and it, so, is the wood also um, susceptible uh, to environmental stimuli or some bacteria or enzyme to degrade it? So do you have any comments on that? Thank you. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, your, your second, second question, I, uh, uh, I have the answer to that is, um, um, yeah, the drawback of uh, of the uh, 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 of super so far, I think it's 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 uh, it's ductility. Uh, we're not really in increasing the ductility of the natural wood much, or sometimes it's slightly decreased as well. Uh, that's something uh, need to be addressed, and I, I think that's a very open uh, uh, question. And but in terms of other uh, uh, properties, like uh, I can give you one example. People actually ask the question that is super wood is more susceptible to termite attack. Because if you have the in the United States, right, and in many other places, if you have the wood house, uh, then termite is a big issue. Uh, so um, because people know that this uh, you are removing the partially removing the lignin uh, content from the from the wood, and uh, those the part that uh, that you know sort of a prevented the, the, the termite uh, attack. Uh, we actually did the calculation. It turns out that, that although you partially removed the lignin out of the uh, wood, but it also densified it. So indeed, the, the aerial density of lignin in the super wood is higher than the natural wood. So in other words, that even a termite that want to attack this super wood, it, take, it has a harder time than uh, attacking a natural wood. Of course, we didn't do the test. Uh, so these are the some new observations uh, we learned along the way. I, what, what was your first question? Did I answer the first question? Oh, the first question just to you, uh, because um, how do you uh, couple your uh, oh, I see. Okay. That's actually a very good good question. And then, and also I, I answered the second question first. The first question, um, that's something we're working on now. Uh, we don't have a good answer yet. Uh, I think that's also a, a very wide open area uh, to um, think about it. How do you use that interface that with other materials in different structures? Yeah, so, so do you expect using uh, adhesive tape like uh, VHB or using traditional screw and the revolt um, to couple with other materials better? Or do you have another or new technology to, to, uh, to, to couple? I think those two approaches or mechanisms you mentioned, uh, to me, that's good enough. You can consider either of them or a combination of those. In reality, this is something I learned from people working on the more applied side of this is, as long as it's working, it's good. And, uh, and and now we don't know what is working, uh, so I think it's wide open. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor. Lee, I have one question. So I know you are collaborating with the DOE, uh, trying to use the super wood as part of the uh, the car. Right, and uh, so I know in the car industry, it's very important to detect the defects in the materials before they send the car to the dealers. So my question is, um, how to de uh, detect the defects in the super wood? 
because I, I guess uh, in metal people can use uh, maybe like guided waves to detect the uh, defects like voids or cracks. But for the wood, uh, do you know if there are any available methods uh, to detect the defects in it? Um, I'm not aware of those, uh, but so the, what we did is, one thing is that we can do it, do the uh, material structure characterization, but that's definitely just on the lab scale. In reality, uh, I'm not sure I, I, I know of a, 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 a fast paced effective ways to tell uh, the, the, the defect. But one thing you can do is as always, as an indirect uh, uh, monitoring of the quality is quality control is to do the uh, uh, strength test, right? Because strength is strongly uh, related to the defects. I think that's probably what uh, automobile in industry is doing as well. I, I don't know. I really doubt if they are doing this real time uh, defect control monitoring of all the pieces they're making. In the automobile industry, the, the, it's all streamlined. It's, everything is going very fast. Uh, probably they will, their suppliers are doing that at their end. Yeah. Uh, so so generally, opinion. for any defect detection, uh, fracture detection, non-destructive for you know, evaluation always come to play. Uh, so you send a guided waves to the material, and then your wave comes back, you compare this to wave, but to these two waves, you, you get a sense of uh, uh, the defect stage uh, of this material. I don't know if this, maybe that's the way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ati. So I have a career related uh, question for you, Dr. Lee. Um, and so I wanted to know what inspired you uh, to go towards the sustainability direction for your lab, um, because eventually I'd like to be a faculty member. So I want to know what led you to decide to go this direction, um, and how do you get inspiration um, to go this direction throughout uh, your PhD, your postdoc, maybe what sort of ways can you look for research directions for your lab? Yeah, so... Um... You are about to get in the probably one of the best advice upcoming, <laughs> getting a good advisor with a, a, a vision, passion, and methodology as well uh, will be very important, especially at, at, at your stage. And uh, the, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, the, 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 the informal interview before the talk, I was rephrasing, uh, rephrasing the, 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 the words, the tips I learned from Ji Gong that uh, um, while work hard on your uh, PhD dissertation on a topic and then spread out and, uh, and then you learn how to, it's the old Chinese saying that it's better to teach people how to fish instead of giving them the fish. So the, the PhD program is to, to, of course, you need to fish and most importantly is to learn how to fish. Then you can go outside by yourself and fish more and even bigger fish. Hope that it helps. <laughs> yeah, it does. So any more questions from the panel? Oh, Robin. Um, I apologize, it's very late, I know, but since many great guys are here, and um, I will regret if I don't ask this question. I have prepared this question for a while now for Tang. Um, and also fill the gap between a junior PhD and a senior professor. So I think I'm a good candidate to do that. So my question about the fish and fishing, right? So um, sometimes I doubt myself, what, what are the skills I gain or I want to have at a, as a mechanician? And I remember um, one, one sentence I learned from Jigang, I really appreciate that is, he said, he said one time, we, we can be creative because we are really ignorant at almost everything. So, um, but sometimes being ignorant is very uh, frustrating, right? So uh, yourself, uh, it's more like a self mental thing. So, um, I know I have gained some skills, for example, fracture mechanics, uh, elasticity, 
and the great uh, AP 282 things, and maybe I have forgot a little bit, but, but, but it's, I think I, I don't have a clear answer. Maybe I don't have a clear question as well. So what kind of skills, maybe soft skills or hard skills do you, do you want to have as a faculty or as a researcher? And uh, how to maintain them or refresh, refresh that? Do you really want to have very hardcore skills or do you want to have more general, maybe you know this thing a little bit, that thing a little bit? I don't know, that's a, yeah, that's a, a ambiguous question. Sorry about that. Teachers, teachers, teachers. <laughs> we have a lot of experts. I, I think it's a You want to share some I think, tips I think with uh, Robbie? Uh, Shigami asked this question. I mean, Shigami asked this question. Oh, she, uh, she, uh, her phones uh, will have a different tape. But uh, so there's one biggest secret I have never shared with anybody. <laughs> I discovered okay. this. Discover, I think I discovered this after I came to Harvard. Suddenly, I realized people surround me, especially students, are very smart very smart so then all i need to do is get them started in something and then ask them to define their own question very frustrating in the beginning for students for especially for some students will be i guess i can speak for you but then they get a hand out of it uh so they really define question for the group and a senior student bring up a younger student and then all students left me. So I was uh, just, yeah, this is the biggest secret, I think. Just have students. So at some point, you will be surrounded by people who have more energy and have a very different vision. Just listen to them. Yeah, if I could make a few comments. So I, I think it's important that you have a, a few um, a basic trait that you know to do as well as anybody. In your case, that would be solid mechanics or it would be, you know, the, 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 there's some basic things that you have to know. But at the same time, it's very important to keep curiosity about other fields and not get intimidated by it. And that's, you know, what Chigang was saying, uh, the best way to do that is to look uh, at your colleagues, but also the, the students around you who have different interests and have seen different things and, and, and be open to that and, uh, and, and uh, not, not be, uh, as I said, not be, be intimidated by any of this. Um, and when it comes to the students, I, I, I've always found, and I learned this from my own advisor, I, I worked at the, I had the great um, fortune to work with David Turnbull, whom, uh, you know, some of you may remember it, but, um, but he, he was really the master at recognizing what this particular strength of a particular student was. He had students around him who were good in different things, and he could pick out what direction would be uh, that they would be most productive in and then he would let them do it even though he himself would not be all that uh, much versed in it he'd be happy if they could take it and, and run with it and, and i think that's that's one of the key things is when you work directly with graduate students is to learn to recognize what what their strengths are and let them then run with those and and give them give them the opportunities and uh, and, and that's also much more satisfying for for your own uh, career as well so all right, Jeremy. What do you think? We should. Uh, I have to go, go get lunch. My my wife is waiting with lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate everyone that uh, sure, well, so, yeah. was Thank you again. Thank you. It was it was a great. Thank you. Yeah. It was really it was a really fun. Yeah. Talk. yeah. Very uplifting. Thank you. More than fantastic. Just uplifting. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. You. <laughs> you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, a good lunch. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Bye.